So I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun. I'm going to be here on and off, obviously, until nine o'clock tonight. So I'm going to take a nice casual pace, pace myself through the day, not get too crazy about it all. Um, but I think it'll be great fun. Like I say this morning, going to work, uh, go through the different tools that Spirecraft carries and that, that we all use um, in some fashion or another. This afternoon, when it's warmer, we'll do uh, some resin coloring. Uh, mixing resin, tinting resin, coloring wood, using dyes, the airbrush, provided I get one cleaned up in time, but I will. I'll clean it during lunch. Uh, all kinds of stuff like that in the color world when it's nice and warm in here, because right now it's still a little cool. And then this evening, uh, we'll be out here just doing all kinds of projects. So that's the general schedule for the day and looking forward to having a good time. And I see Mr. Michael Quinn. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. And I'll start off and I'll say this repeatedly so it might get old to you guys if you you got in here first. If you have any kind of questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, just whenever you hear me stop talking and you have a question, pop up and say, hey, can you tell me about, can you show me, can you explain? And I will do everything I can to, to cover the question. So don't hesitate to ask. That's why we're here. Um, People say, yeah, you know, I wondered, but then I wondered about something. And I'm like, well, if you would have asked me, I could have shown you. So don't don't be shy. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard to want to, you know, kind of get out front there a little bit, but it's okay. You don't have to have your picture up, but, but ask the questions that you have. You know what I'm saying? Um, does everybody have their coffee or their soda or their tea or whatever they might have in mind for the morning? Ready to rock. Yes. Because I've got mine just out of sight over here. Yeah. Got my coffee and the snow is coming down. Snow's coming down. I wish I wish I was in my snow land right now. Let me put this phone on silent. So it doesn't bother me. Um, like I say, I'm in South Georgia right now where it almost never gets cold, really cold. But I've got a, a a property, a house up in Colorado in a town called Leadville at 10,000 feet where there's lots of snow. And I should be out there riding my snowmobile right now, but I'm not. Um, and that's the way it is. Brian, you're on the road. You, you can't you can't turn watch turning and drive. <laughs> He's got his mute on, but that's cool. Be safe. You can watch. Hey, Brad. Be... It's actually me, Bradley. Oh. How you doing? You're sneaking in under his name. I'm, yeah, I'm sneaking in on the way into to work. Um, but I snuck in under his name because we finally got the Brylor Custom website or uh, business set up. So we'll be starting to sell some of the stuff he's turning. Oh, cool! That's great. Yeah, I can't say too much because I've done a lot of um, uh, video conferences driving down the interstate, so I really can't talk <laughs> about not <laughs> about not doing it. So I know what it's all about. Um, and you do what you got to do. Well, let me see. Where should we start? Um, before I even start with, with the folks that are here already, does anybody have any specific turning tool kind of question that's just burning that you would like me to try and address? The only thing I have is, is between the... Uh, um, on their uh, easy wood tools, the bits, uh, difference between the regular bit and the, uh, the negative rake. Negative rake. The difference between the negative rakes and the standard bit, and I've got happen to have the same one set up here. And the, the close ups are going to be tough today. I'm trying to figure out, let me see, because I don't have auto zoom on. The cameras, someday I'll spend the money for PTZ cameras, but until then, we're going to have to work at it the old way. But usually I can get in there pretty good on them. Let's see if that will get into, into focus there. Okay, for better or worse, I've zoomed in on the side camera 
on these are two of the round cutters the ci3 size um the one on the right is the negative rake and i know it's a little hard to see but you see that bevel on the top whereas the standard tool here on the left is completely flat so they came up with these because the especially in resins the the it's easy for the resins to chip out. Polyester is the worst, and then the epoxies and the urethanes are better. Uh, if the tool runs perfectly flat like this, they work, but you still have the tendency to chip. And one thing they found was people were turning, the, tipping the tools down to essentially get a less aggressive cut, which they were creating their own negative rake angle, if you will. And so what Easywood did is said, well, let's take the negative rate concept like we have in our regular tools. They put the angle on the top, the second bevel, so that takes away some of the aggressiveness. And you can still keep the tool flat. Okay. And it makes a huge difference um, in the way the tool cuts, especially in the resins. Um it's not nearly as aggressive. They don't, in their marketing and literature, don't speak about aggressiveness or, or lack thereof. Got pop back up here. Uh, they don't really talk about whether, the, you know, one's more aggressive than the other. Um, but it is a fact that the negative rake is, is noticeably less aggressive. Um, by the same token, it is easier to work with brittle harder woods. So that's why they, they'll recommend it for resin and hard woods. Uh, like if I look right here on um, the package, it'll say resins slash hardwoods. Okay. You got to be turning some really pretty hard wood for that to come into play. If you're turning a typical piece of uh poplar maple ash you know at least those are the common woods for me uh they don't the negative rakes actually i get bored they don't cut fast enough for me so i won't use the negative rakes there uh they do come standard i'm um, back up here on their little mini hollowers uh because this tool it, with an aggressive cutter on it can be difficult to drive it tends to want to grab, and the, the shafts are smaller in the first place. Uh, so they put the negative rake on them to take some of the aggressiveness away and make it easier for people to uh, control the tool. Now, once you've gotten used to using, say, the small tools, et cetera, and you're turning wood, you're probably going to put a regular cutter back on it to go in there uh, to get faster, uh, more productive cutting. If it is catching, if, if things are grabbing on you, it regardless of what kind of wood you're working with, uh, you can always switch to a negative rate cutter and take some of that aggressiveness away. Um, so that's really what they do. That's it, it gives you a less aggressive cut in the wood, in the resin, doesn't chip out. Uh, it makes a cleaner cut, just like if we have, and I don't have a negative rate scraper set up here. Um, in our standard scrapers, somebody stole my negative rate scraper out on the road and I haven't replaced it. Oh, let me go to here. In a standard scraper, this is a Carter and Son bowl gout or bowl scraper. You know, we only have the single bevel. If it was a negative rake scraper, it would have the second rake up here on the top. Um, and I just haven't gone over to the grinder because I like to keep this one as it is because uh, not everybody has the negative rakes. But the principle is the same. You get a cleaner cut with that compound angle. And it really came out of, you know, that's been in the in the conventional tools for quite some time using the negative rake. And I don't know who first came up with it. I mean, it's very similar in principle to a skew. It's not identical because skews angles are the same. The negative rake has two different angles on your on your conventional tools, as well as on the carbide cutters. So again, biggest thing it does if you're turning resin or really, really hard stuff. Uh, it make it's great. It, it is night and day. So, uh, do you turn resin currently? Some, yes. Some. So, if you haven't used one yet, get yourself whichever tool, um, probably either the round or square, 
and just if you just want to experiment with it and, and you can even get the the little easy starts i don't have one handy uh, if you just want to try it they're their least expensive entry tool the cutter all their cutters fit all the same tools so if you get an easy start tool it'll take a ci3 standard or a ci3 nr cutter and you can experiment with it for totally for under a hundred dollars for tool and an extra cutter um, and be in there it, there's no difference in the cutter it's just the handle it, that's all there is they work exactly the same yeah uh, so that would be the way to test it out and then if the second one i would recommend probably after that would be a radius one which i've got here it, a radius negative freak so the round cutters make uh, somewhat of a, let's see if I can hold this and, and emulate with my finger. They make kind of a, a wavy cut. So my finger goes across there. So you want to come back with this radius style cutter and clean up those uh, wavy marks. Think of it as kind of like the waves in an ocean. The round cutter makes it uh, easy to get the little scallops and hard to get rid of them. Uh, a radius style cutter will come across there and basically cut all the high points off so that it flattens it out and smooths it out. So that would be the next tool uh, that I would go in the negative rake world. And then the final would be the detail style tool, the pointy guys. And the miniature tool has the what they call a CI7, which is a long pointy tool. Uh, it's great for real fine detail. There's also the CI4 in a negative rake, which is more rounded on the ends. It's it's less aggressive. The the really pointy tool is great, and you can do real real fine lines with it. The thing you need to be careful of is it's got such a fine point. It's easy to load both sides quickly, and if you load too much of both sides on these diamond cutters, they tend to catch just a little bit. Whereas if I put a standard, and this isn't negative rake, but if I put a standard up there against it, see the difference in the profile on the tip? Okay. So the one on the left, much more forgiving. The one on the right, much more detail oriented. And you can get the, the CI4 in a negative rake as well. So it just depends on what your needs are. Okay. They, they both have their place. Uh, again, I love this little guy. I also have one of these exact tools that the shaft is bent. Uh, looks about like one of those Halloween tools with a curve in it because I actually went too far and then I jammed it, my bad, into the, the chuck jaws. <laughs> and so if you stick one of these into a chuck jaw turning into a thousand RPMs, it will bend the shaft. So don't do that. Don't you guys fall? Uh, you can't see over here. I've got I've got racks and racks of tools, precariously balanced some days, depending on what I'm doing. So did that help help you uh, understand on the the differences there? Yes, I I've got a micro with I put the negative rake on and because I my minis are they were chipping out, but I haven't tried the micro yet on the resin. Okay. So if you've already got the minis, um, just throw throw a negative rate cutter on there. Yep. And I think you'll 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 be fine. You'll find it's great. Uh, yeah. What kind of resin are you turning? Uh, that was just for pens and some bottle stoppers uh, com composite. I don't make my own resin. I'll listen to you on that later. So it it comes under the generic term of acrylic, right? Yes. Sir. Which there means you, you don't know what it is. Yeah. I I love how they do that. Um, but that's the way it is. It's a nice generic name for any of the resins. Um, so let's, uh, let's play. I'm going to get a piece of wood out and kind of get things set up. We'll set up a piece of wood, um, get it on the chuck, maybe on a face plate between centers first. I've got these little blanks of wood and then I'll use different tools here this morning just to, to do some basic turning and show the different tools. Uh, does that sound like a plan? Looks like we got folks coming in. Uh, let's see. Alan's in here. Arthur, Dan. 
Good morning, and Michael, hope you all are doing well. Pleasure to see you up and early and going. I'm having a ball, and I just got started. So the turning today is not going to be anything uh, to get excited about, per se. I don't have anything in mind, you know, special. Uh, again, it's more about showcasing the products, what, what tools do what, how we can best use them. As I, I say that, as I open up this beautiful piece of spalted something, hopefully it's not split. I've got, I've got way too much wood in my collection. I have uh, a wood storage on the end of my far shop here. I have wood that I'm storing outside to basically spalt, decay, rot, so that it can be stabilized. And I have wood at a shop up in North Georgia, uh, and racks and racks of it. So I have way too much wood, and I'm going to guess this is a piece of sycamore that we have here. And you can see it's got some nice spalting in it. And I'm zoomed way in right now on that end camera. So it's got some ambrosia. It's a, it's a double two for one here today. It's got some ambrosia in it. It's got some splits in it. And it's got some nice spalting in it as well and it's just a, it's just a small blank uh it's about six inches in diameter here something like that so we'll get this guy mounted up uh lots of ways we could go we could put this on a face plate and i'm not sure which i'll go with here today but we'll talk about the different things So, and I'll, I'm going to leave this in the overhead as long as we can see there. Sure. So, typical faceplate. Uh, this happens to be an easy wood faceplate. Uh, it's got eight screws. It looks like it's a two and a half inch. Would be fine for this piece. Uh, not a problem at all. One of the things that I find that I have learned to like is called a Center Master, which is from Carter Products. Not like not Carter and Son Toolworks, but Carter Products, who makes. Uh, the bandsaw blades, the steady rest, the hollow roller system. The nice thing about this uh, center master is if you also use a Carter Products uh, bandsaw, uh, the circle jig, the circle cutter, to make the circle cutter work, you drill a hole in the middle of your blank, set it on your cutter, go up to your bandsaw, you cut your blank perfectly round, and by default, it has a quarter inch hole in the middle. So this little guy, and I'll go back to the overhead. When you have a quarter inch hole in your blank, which we don't have here, you put your face plate on, you thread these in. These things are like 20 bucks. And there's a little pin that goes right in here. And that lines up your face plate right on the center of where you've already cut it. So that gives you a great way to center uh, your face plate so you don't have to wonder and measure and guess, especially if you. We can't hear you. I didn't mute myself. I am I am back there, right? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, so I don't know why it muted me because there's nobody over there unless I have a ghost in the studio. Um, when did I stop talking? When, when did you stop hearing me? Has it been a while? You were saying how that little disc finds oh, yourself. How this guy lines up? Yes, sir. Okay, so so that lines up. It has a pin that goes in the, the hole you drilled when you cut your blank with a with a circle uh, jig on a bandsaw. Uh, so that's where I was at there, and then I guess I quit out, quit for some reason. Uh, with the faceplate, I like to use a number ten screw, and these are short ones right here. These are only like an inch long, 
And it may look like a Phillips, but it's actually a square drive slash Phillips. Um, number 10s are much stronger. They also fit in the counterbore of your faceplate much better than a number eight does. Don't use drywall screws. Always keep in mind how much screw you have sticking through. Make sure you have enough length for the strength of the project at hand. Okay. Uh, so that's one way to mount the piece. Another way, uh, when you buy a chuck, typically they all come with what is called a worm screw. And I'm going to put this worm screw over here. Worm screw, this is the Easywood Tools one for their chucks. Has a threaded end, self-tapping threads. The square section goes into the jaws on the chuck. Uh, theirs happens to be double-ended, so you've got two different uh, sizes for these. And I'll put it down here. When you drill for your, or oh, I think it rolled off. When you drill the hole for it, depending on the wood, see if I can find a drill bit here real quick. You know how it is when you have a hundred of them, but then you can't find it when you're looking for it because you put it somewhere else. When you, uh, when you drill for your pilot hole, make sure that the shaft matches uh, the inner shaft of the worm screw. And I'll hold that up a little bit closer. And you can, you can lay it over the top and look down. If I used the big end and this small drill bit, uh, I probably wouldn't have uh, a big enough hole for it to thread in easily. Um, by the same token, when we're, when we're drilling a hole and choosing our drill bit, if it's a soft wood, go ahead and make the hole a little bit smaller. If you have a really hard wood, make the hole just a little bit oversized because it's going to be hard uh, for it to get in. Okay? And let me know if, if I turn off for some reason again over there automatically. Because I see Don talking, but I can't hear him. Yes, Don? So you, Don's having trouble there. Everybody else is muted. Okay. I want to make sure I didn't turn off because I can't, I don't have the computer over here. Let me just double check. You're just not cutting me off. Oh, I'm good. So I think for this little guy today, let's go ahead. Sorry for me walking in front of the camera there. And we're going to go ahead and use the worm screw on this. Are you are you back, Don? And I'm just going to pick a side, any side. And I'm just going to estimate the middle of this. I'm not going to worry about it too terribly much. Uh, I can't hear your audio, Don, if that's what you're saying, asking. Is anybody else having trouble with audio? Uh, I can you loud and clear. Is you loud and clear? Okay. Just sometimes, you know, we all have trouble, and it's always good to make sure that it's it's not everybody or me. I uh, appreciate that, Sue. So this is the Easywood Tools, Chuck, and let me zoom this other camera back out here a little bit. There we go. And so this is the Chuck that... Uh, that we'll put this in now the easy chuck one of the nice things about the easy chuck is it has 
the quick change jaw system. Little tool pops in, releases the jaws. We'll put those right out front. Super handy if you need to change jaws a lot. Now, I also have the Sorby Chuck out here today, and I've got all kinds of chucks over here in the box. Um, Sorby Chuck is a traditional chuck, and it uses the screws to hold the jaws in, so you have to take the screws out, change the jaws. Um, works great. That's the way it's been forever and ever. The Easy Chuck has the quick change. So I do need to put a smaller set of jaws in here. And I'm going to show you one other way we could mount this as well. There is uh, step drives and step centers. I also have here before I put the um, before I put the worm screw in. This is a Sorby step drive. Spring-loaded cone in the center. Teeth all around the outside edge. These also go in the chuck jaws. These are super handy. So it locks right in. You can use them for spindle work. You can use them. So let's say while we're at it here, Doesn't look like I got that in there perfectly square. We'll change gears just a touch for a second. Make sure it's turning true. There we go. Let's say instead of using a spur drive for mounting a piece of spindle blank, we could mount that right up with that uh, step drive, okay? And that's in a chuck. So let's say you have your chuck, uh, if you use the worm screw or the set screw on your chuck, and I'm gonna move this chuck over, just, or this over just a little bit so we can get this into picture. So you can see how that is sitting. It sits out proud of the jaws, okay? And it sits inside the jaws. Again, we'll pop that over end shot there so you can see how it sits inside the jaws. Now, let me pop this off of here real quick, if I don't drop my tools. Because if you don't have the chuck in place, let's say, or you had another reason to want a different type of step drive, they also come in a Morris taper. So I'm on the end camera. So here's the Morris taper. And you can go in that way with no chuck whatsoever. By the same token, if you wanted to have a step drive that revolves, and I'll go to up he overhead here. So this one is a revolving step. Instead of having your typical live center, you can have a revolving stub on a Morris taper in your tailstock. So super handy. So you could have both Morris taper styles and have, what's nice about this system is that both are spring loaded. So if you want to adjust your stock around, so I can let go of it on the spring tension. And if I want to move it and, and adjust it, I can do that easily. They're pretty cool. It's great for centering a piece just the way you want it. Um, if you want to adjust even a big bowl blank for the grain, uh, they're fantastic. And when you get it where you want it, then you just tighten things up and you're good to go. So those are super handy. And we could mount the bowl with, with one of these as well. We could have this bowl pop right in here. You know, I might line it up like so. And it is mounted between centers on step drives. One revolving, one fixed.
uh, in a Morse. So lots of ways to get where you're going. There's more than one way to mount a piece. It all depends on what you like, what you have. Like, let's say you do a lot of spindle turning, and this is your 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 main focus. Spindle turning, you just need to throw a bowl on here. You want to make a quick bowl. There's no reason why you can't mount a bowl here to get it started, to get it round and put a tenon on it. So a very, very flexible, very universal uh, way to approach things. Pop that back out of there. So all these are in the store. We have uh, some of them were out. E or not easy would Sorby. All the manufacturers right now are running uh, horribly, un and not to their. It's not everybody's. It's not any one person's fault or any company's fault. Uh, virtually every company is running behind on delivery because of our wonderful pandemic and the COVID and all that has slowed everything down in the supply chains. So if you go into the store and you look at some of the Sorby products that uh, Spirecraft has, they may uh, show up as out of stock and not able to back order. That's because we're looking at about a three to four month uh, lag right now with Sorby coming out of England because they keep getting locked down pretty hard. So I'm gonna set these back off to the side for now and go back to our original working with the chuck and a worm screw. Now again, anybody got a question along the way, please holler. Ask me what is coming to mind. So I drilled the little hole in this today. We'll see if I guessed right. I honestly just grabbed the first drill bit that I found in a drawer over there on the work table in front of me. The, so here's what happens, the beauty of these. If we were using the faceplate, imagine the faceplate being in place. So we have the surface area here, the faceplate and the eight screws holding the piece to the wood. Here we have one hole in the middle and the jaws giving us the support. Now you might say, well, so is that, why is that important or what's the difference? If you wanted to make, if you were making a hollow form and say it was a small hollow form, like, and I'm gonna change the camera so I don't walk in front of it here for a second. Let's say you were gonna make a hollow form that had this holds about an inch and a half, right? If I used this faceplate, which is about the same diameter as the piece of wood, well, I'd have all these screw holes out in my wood. Whereas when I use the worm screw, I just have the one hole right in the center. So depending on what your, your project is, it can make a big difference as to what's the best way to go. That's why the worm screws are so handy. You just have one hole in the center uh, wherever you're gonna turn things away. So it can be quite helpful in that regard. So spindle locked to start with. Hopefully this will thread on there. Push a little bit in. The, the threads are self uh, cutting. I will go overhead for you. And you'll see that start to wind on. Now this wood, the sycamore is actually fairly soft. So one thing that's important as you, as you tighten the piece up, keep in mind that the wood is only so strong before you start to pull the threads out of the fibers. Um, you're gonna run a tailstock, you should at least, uh, for safety to, to come up. So don't keep tightening this until you strip it, because once you strip it, you're, you're done. Uh, you have to go to, to plan B. And that's always a, a good question. Well. How tight is tight enough? This one I can feel, because I know this wood pretty well. I've got, I've been going through 6,000 pounds of it. Uh, it doesn't hold the threads really well. So that's, that's snug and I'm gonna stop right there, okay? And I'm gonna pop just my live center, my standard live center back in here. This is the easy wood live center. Oh, 
All righty. Uh, so now we're between centers. We have our worm screw in. We got our center up in the uh, top there. We go to overhead. You can see things are, the piece is not true. It's not too bad out in, in this realm. It's not too far around. It's pretty far out here though, okay? Oh, well, it's a beautiful morning. I'm looking out the windows here. We, we've had about a week on and off of gray and rain. So I am very happy to see the, the weather being nice. All right. So here we are. We got our rough blank. And also, let's see, we have a little bit of a knot issue right there. And we have a split right there. And I'm just going to go ahead and take that right off of there. So not only, you know, are we doing our product showcase here today, but I want to be sure I, you know, I give you, especially if you're just getting started, I want to give you these inside, uh, some tips on getting turning safely and all that. So with that, that space right there, we just went ahead and peeled that off because it needed to go anyhow. All right. So let's see, am I plugged in? Am I turned on? I must not be with my lathe plugged in yet. How about that? Let's see here. It would help if the lathe was plugged in, Riley. Minor details. There we go. Okay, we've actually got a pretty good look from all the different directions. I'm looking at the cameras. So there's our end camera. We'll be able to see pretty well there what's going on. I might bring that in a little bit tighter for you. Okay, so we can see the tools working there. Uh, the overhead is pretty good. No, that was the end camera. See, there's the there's the end camera now. Sometimes I get confused with my buttons. Okay. Now, one thing I did notice is when I put my tail stock up, I may not have hit the dead center. There we go. I had a little bit of a noise to it there. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we want to get it round. What tool do we want to use to get it round? Into carbide tools, and we'll, we'll cover everything. The carbide tools, they would typically recommend, um, well, that's the radius one, but the square style cutter it's they call it the rougher um i call it the square tool that it was this was the first uh, easy wood tools the first carbide cutter to my knowledge at least that was mass marketed started the trend with the carbide tools okay uh works great nothing wrong with that whatsoever you can use your bowl gouge your standard everyday bowl gouge whichever one you might have to to rough this down to round but because this is face grain and end grain and face grain and end grain, you do not, repeat, do not, wherever mine went, want to use your spindle roughing gouge, okay? Never, never, never don't do it. You will get hurt. You'll break something. Don't use a spindle roughing gouge on a bowl blank, okay? Any of your other gouges will be just fine. So I'll use a bowl gouge and I'll use a carbide uh, square cutter. I'm bound to have one here. Yeah, that's not radius. I don't know why I grabbed the radius one. So we'll do a little of both. I will start with the carbide tool. Put on the face mask. 
Uh, if you haven't seen these, I've used the old version of the Jackson safety mask for years, which was fixed. I now have the flip up versions. And these things are fantastic. They're about $25. Uh, I drill extra holes right here in the, right in the very center. I drill extra holes here for breathing. The goggles are ventilated, but just by the nature of working, uh, we tend, if you don't have a fan blowing, you will, you might fog up a little bit. So you, I just drill some holes right through here. Not big enough for anything big to get through. Uh, the dust would come through anyway. It's gonna come around. These things are great, and now I can lift up and down, and I never take the protection off of my eyes, so I never forget to cover my eyes back up. And the other beauty uh, for me here doing demonstrations is when I flip the goggles, the face shield up, my audio is much better than when it's down like that. So with the carbide tools, and again, anybody, when you have a question, holler. Lewis Kaufman, thanks for jumping in, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, let me go overhead here. So this is the roughing tool, easy wood tools, the carbide tools. We want them to run at the center axis of the lathe. And you can see here, let me go to the end camera. So you can see I'm lining that cutter up with the center axis of the lathe, all right? That's where I want to be, and I want to keep that tool uh, dead flat. I don't want the handle to be down with the cutter up, and I don't want the handle up with the cutter down. I want it to stay just nice and level to the floor. That's how it's been uh, designed to run. Now, also, if you'll notice, say this cutter uh, being a CI2, this is about 3 eighths of an inch across. You can utilize the entire cutter, but I strongly encourage you to only use about half. So when I start cutting here, on this, on the back side, and you can see the cutter here now, just in the frame. I won't use the entire cutter. I will use half the cutter, and I'll take twice as many cuts. It's much easier on me, much less friction. Um, also, we have our worm screw in here. If we put too much pressure against the piece, and we have more force with the tool hitting the wood and, and resistance in the wood, we run the risk of stripping our worm screw uh, from coming through. So we want to be sure that we, we go in here gently and easily. And plus, it's just easier on you. So I've set that where it's about a finger's width apart oh, from coming through. There or so. This piece will turn out about 700 RPMs. Now, it's just habit for me, my habit is that I start on the left-hand side. Uh, you'll see I have two fingers on the tool as I set the tool in place. You don't need a death grip, okay? Just a couple of fingers to hold it down. That's all it takes. Oop, oh, oh, not there. Hopefully I didn't crazy things up. Half the cutter. And I may have to put the cameras on manual focus. And I want to cut a little bit more here. Now you can see the this nice flat here, and you can see the ghost image over here. So that's all I'm doing is taking that ghost image away. I can also come into the very back here if I want to. and clean up that profile. One of the beauties of these square style cutters is you can cut with the front edge or the sides. So I can come in here and I can come back and use the side to cut and clean if I want to, okay? So I just step my way across. We'll do about half of this this way. Okay, and so there we have, we've gotten it round. 
just just to know just enough to be round get us where we want to be now i'll switch over to uh, one of the carter and son bowl gouges decide which one i want to use here this is a, a 5 8 bowl carter and son bowl gouge okay now the carter and son gouges and i actually have some over here in the box of brand new uh, I think I'm going to take a second here and show you. So this happens to be one I've had for a couple of years. Um, the aluminum handles, they have a wonderful shaft. The aluminum handles are cool. If you live in the South, we really like it. But these tools come just like a carbide tool comes sharp. The Carter and Son tools come sharp and ready to go right out of the box. And let me open up because I've got some of these tools are going out tomorrow's ups uh, i believe some of these are going to mr wolfgang i think if i remember correctly i can't keep it all in my head but these came in on saturday everybody's running behind trying to get their products out so we're all just being patient making things work out Let's see. Down in here. I haven't even opened this box up yet. Okay. So I have a half inch bowl gouge here. I'm on the overhead camera. Half inch bowl gouge fresh out of the tube, and they come pre-ground from the factory. And let me go to the, I think I can show you better maybe on the end camera. It might show a little bit better. Let's see here. Pre-ground with a 50 degree uh, profile on them, and the heel has slightly been ground away. So these are, are razor sharp, they're CBN sharpened. All right. And it looks like Mr. Elrod needs to be let in. So let me let Mr. Elrod into the meeting here. Not sure why he didn't pop in automatically. We certainly don't want to leave Mr. Elrod out. Sorry if you had to wait at the door too long there, Jim. Um, so now Jim's in. Good deal. Good to see you, sir. So these come pre-sharpened, ready to go right out of the box. They Again, they are in a 50-degree grind. If that's the grind you prefer, they are ready to roll right out of the box, sharpened on the CBN wheels. Okay? Pretty cool deal. Pop this back over in the box, because that is going out to... Somebody here real soon. I'm going to jump back over to the overhead. And we'll go with the bowl gouge now. Get my face mask back on. So this is a larger 5 8 bowl gouge. Uh, my tools are sharpened at about 45 degrees. And for roughing, I'm just going to use the very tip of this tool. Won't be using the wings. I've got some ground swept back wings on here. I'll just be using the very tip and lower my tool rest down on. This one, is a, it doesn't go super low. And I'm just going to come in with the very tip of the tool. All right, so I won't be using any wing initially, just the very tip. And that's probably a good way to look at it from the side there. And I like to just go laterally and work my way right across. Now, as soon as I start to get it smoothed out, I can then turn the tool over and start to utilize a little bit of the cutting wing. And I see that I'm going to have to put that camera 
that overhead camera is going to have to go into manual focus. I didn't set it on manual focus this morning, and I can see that it's going out of focus as it spins. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm going to put you on the end camera there. Then I'm going to jump up on my little stool. This would be a great time for anybody who's got any questions to unmute and ask away while I climb up to the ceiling and make my adjustment right there. Looks like you need an assistant. I do need an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someday, maybe, I will have one. Either I need an assistant or really expensive equipment that that uh, does things automatically much better. These cameras that I'm using, I can't complain. I've been using these cameras for probably, gosh, five years out on the road with the woodworking show. Um, they're Canon R600s. I've got four of them. Uh, there's a big Sony that's the front camera there. Uh, they were about $800 cameras when they came out on the market. I think I paid $200 for them. They've spent five years on the road. I figured if they got run over by a forklift, I wasn't out too much, or if they got beat up in some other fashion. So I really can't complain. They've served me well. Now, the other thing I'm going to go check, I'm going to switch you to the overhead for a second. I'm going to go check the end camera and get it on manual focus as well, because they just won't quite stay in focus. So let me pop you on the overhead there real quick. Like I said, we got all day here. So there's no need in getting uh, things not the way we want them. So we put it on manual focus there. That should stay in focus now. I do believe. Let's test that. Let's test the overhead. See if that stays in focus now when it's running. Looks pretty good. See if we stay in focus over here. Looks pretty good. All right. Um, all right, so we have it smooth and round. We're ready to start to shape and or make a tendon. So we're going to want to put our tendon, our gripping tendon on this back end which is back over here, and we can see it in here. So we can start to do two things. We can start to shape this profile as we come around, or we could just go ahead and come in here and cut this flat and then make our tendon. It, it, I don't know that there is one way that is much better than the other. Sometimes it might depend on the, uh, the piece of wood and, the, and what you're doing. We're going to go with the fact that we think we have a strong enough grip in our worm screw here. And let's go with cleaning up the, the, uh, the bottom of this first. We'll make that our first move. Okay. Now, if I use a carbide style tool, again, I'm going to want to center the carbide tools at the center axis of the lathe. And you can see our little hole that's right there in the center. Okay. The carbide tools, you always want to center on the center axis. And I recommend with these tools, again, going straight in. It can be a little bouncy going lateral, so just come straight in initially. Okay. And then you can also come back at that point and cut laterally. So what we're doing here is we're letting the front cutter, front edge be our guide and we're actually cutting with the right hand side of the cutter. And we just push straight across. Okay. And that's a great way to make a nice flat uh, surface for your initial cuts with the carbide cutters. Now, if we wanted to use our bowl gouge, if that's what we have, I lowered my tool rest back down. In this case, I'm going to drop the handle of the tool down. 
I'm going to go ahead and drop the handle of the tool down. And then I'm going to draw the tool across, starting in the center, using the wing. And voila, you have a flat surface. So both ways get you exactly the same place. This is a pretty piece of wood, isn't it? I love it when I find pretty wood out there in the in the box. Um, so we can start to shape our corner off. We can make our tendon now, whichever we want to do. Again, it just depends on your preference. I think we'll go ahead and make a tendon. Now, the one thing I need to find is my calipers. Find my calipers. They're supposed to be in this drawer. And we're going to go with just a small tenon here. And since I have one inch draws on the uh, sorbet chuck, we'll go with the two and three eighths, two and three eighths inch draws on the easy chuck. So I just take my calipers. They're two and three eighths. I set my caliper to two and a half. Okay. And we do have uh, in the store the Sorby, uh a variety of calipers, inside, outside calipers, vessel calipers, things of that nature. If I wanted to use, if I want to use my carbide tool for making my tenon, uh, I'm just going to come right in here at the end. I'm going to raise my tool rest back up. I have two methods. My preferred method before I started using the carbide tools was a quarter inch gouge. And I have one specially ground just for that and other little things. I love a quarter inch gouge. This is a little quarter inch gouge and it's got the wing swept back very far back uh, like a full size gouge. And it allows me with the 45 degree angle here i can actually make a vertical wall and come across to make my tenon so in in the past i would always i would come in and start my cut like so and then work my way around but i found over time when i started using the carbide tools uh, that these were much faster and easier let's see if i was close there on that it was pretty close so what I'll do with a carbide tool is I'll just come in, make a light cut, check it with my calipers. I want my tendon to be as close to the perfect circle of the jaws as I can get. It's a little bit smaller. There we go. And that's all we need to do there. Now, you may find with these carbide tools, here's one thing, you're using the entire cutter now. And you get a lot of resistance coming straight into it. So that's the time when you might want to come in sideways. And remember, because we're on a worm screw, we don't want to be super aggressive. Okay, as we start to build that. Now, let's say we we have just our, our bowl gouge. Drop that down. There's a little knot. That's what that hard noise was. That was a knot right there. We can take our quarter-inch gouge. I went down a little too far. Come right down the wall. Okay. And then I can come ahead and come across. If that's what I want to do. What I would do realistically is I would go ahead and start to shape this piece a little bit. Because I know we're going to make a little bowl. So I'll just begin this little shaping. Let me pop you over here with the bowl gouge. This works great. You come right in. 
we start to cut, and then as soon as we get in there, you can see the bevel. I'll let you see here. The bevel is just riding right up against it. That's what's supporting your cut. Okay. Now, if I'm working in a carbide style tool, like say from Easywood, I'm going to use a round tool. I do need to raise that back up just a fuzz. Principle's going to be the same. Now, let me show you from the end. I want to be sure and leave this flat section right here, a nice flat section for my jaws. Now, my tendon is not completely cut yet, but I've gotten rid of all this extra wood here. Okay, so now we can go ahead and continue on with our tent, cutting our tendon. And I'll just come in from the side and here's one of the reasons I really like using the carbide tool now, is that this 3 8 of an inch square cutter in the CI2 exactly matches the depth of my jaws. I'll use one of these. This exactly matches the depth of my jaws. Let's see how I can show this to you. Get this lined up right. Okay, you see that? So I can use that as my guide. So when I when I cut to the back corner of this cutter, I know that I have cut just the right amount and I still have about a sixteenth of an inch or so clearance down here on the bottom. We want to be sure that our, our bowl touches on the top of the jaws and does not touch down on the bottom. If it sits down here on the bottom where my finger's touching and doesn't sit here, the piece will rock and it'll probably snap your tendon off or it'll come out. And then you can also notice that the jaws have a dovetail. So once you cut your tenon, the next thing I would show you is to take your, your jaw. And I haven't put the dovetail on here yet. And I see the colors changed in my overhead. And you can always check your tenon. Uh, with one, take one jaw out. And you can check your tenon for fit. Okay. I'm going to have to adjust that... Uh, exposure on that camera i see it's changed on me now that the light has changed uh so let's go back to go back to the end and i'm very close okay now there's my length now when i look at this tenon i don't know if you can see it in the overhead it's still got a little bit of a dome shape to it. So with the carbide tool, I want to come across just using the flat cutter. All right. If I want to use my bowl gouge or spindle gouge in this matter, but you'd probably use your bowl gouge. Just make sure that that is slightly concave. Easiest way to do that. Take your tool and put it across the, the uh, tenon. You see a little bit of daylight right in there. You know you're concave, so the bottom of that will not touch. You want to make sure this bottom isn't touching down inside. Now, with my little quarter-inch bowl gouge here, the Carter and Son, I need to cut a dovetail. So I can do it with this. I can start to cut my dovetail. I need about a 10-degree dovetail. And with the flat profile that I've got on the top there, you can see that that allows me to that, that tool bevel comes right down the, the tenon and my wing is right there works great now the other way is with a carbide tool and a diamond style the detailer you come right down and cut the same profile okay and then if you, you want to make sure you have a nice flat shoulder here so you can do that with your carbide tool your diamond tool or with your bowl gouge and again come right up make sure you have a nice flat corner nice flat section 
you're all good. Now, the other thing that's always nice to do in case you end up remounting this piece, take your little detail tool or whatever else you've got and always mark the center there just a little bit, okay? So we are now set in our, our grip here and we're ready to turn this whole piece. And since we have all day and I have it, uh, oh, I'm on the front camera right now. Uh, I was trying to show you that, that we have everything ready here. Um, you can see this overhead camera, the, the color is, is way off. So I'm gonna put you in the end camera again. I'm gonna grab my stool, my infamous little ladder, and I'm gonna make an adjustment. And again, excellent time while I'm fooling with this. If anybody has a question, unmute your mic and fire away. That's what I'm here for. Find my exposure. Take care of that. So got a little yellow tint to it. Going to be that way. Looks like. See if I can't do one more thing here to fix this. This is the one camera that does some strange things to me sometimes. Which can be a bit of a bother. Maybe I should break down one of these days and, uh, and uh, upgrade these little guys. So I'm not hearing any questions out there. Somebody's bound to have something they want to know about a tool or something. Yes? No? Everybody's quiet today. Okay. Well, we're just going to have to have this be yellow, a little bit yellow today. It doesn't want to cooperate for whatever reason. I don't want to spend a lot of your time fooling with that. So it'll just have to have a little bit of yellow tint to it. We'll work on that for later on. Hello, whoever jumped in. That looks like Alan Alder. Either you just jump in. Thank you for joining us. I was playing with camera adjustments, trying to get a little bit better color coming off the overhead camera. It decided it wanted to go yellow. It's always something. Um, so we've been playing with our bowl gouges and our carbide tools, making this simple little bowl. We're ready to go ahead and shape. So again, with doesn't matter which of these tools. Lost your audio again. That's interesting. Thank you for letting me know. Please let me know whenever it goes out because I don't see it on the uh, monitor that I'm watching. I can see it on the computer over there. And I, I guess it did come back, correct? It popped up that Alan uh, muted you. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> now I know what happened. 
I don't have a ghost in my co in control room. Um, so uh, we can using the the carbide style tools with the round cutter, we can shape this piece. We can shape it uh, with the bowl gouge with the conventional tools. They both will get us to the same place. Okay, um, just a little bit different when it comes to uh, very curvy shapes. If I have a preference, I do have a preference. I should rephrase that. When it comes to a, a very curvy shape that I want to make, and I don't know that I've got anything out here that represents that right now where I have curves that go in and out per se, I'm going to lead lean towards working with a round carbide style tool. I like to think of this as a more of a sculpting shaping tool. You could be like a sculptor and just kind of carve um, a very undulating shape quite easily because you don't have bevels to worry about. Um, you don't get the catches like you do with conventional gouge. So it's great for making those undulating shapes. Conversely, if I want a nice, smooth, long transition type of shape, I'm going to go with a bowl gouge because if you were here earlier, you might have heard me talking about the round cutters tend to give us a little bit of a wavy profile. Uh, it takes a long time and you got to make sure your tool rest is in great shape uh, to not get a little bit of a wavy profile just because of the nature of a round cutter. It's not bad. It's just the nature of the beast. It lets you make those nice swoopy curves. Does that much easier than a bowl gouge does, but at, at, the, at the risk of the cost of a little bit of a wavy edge. Harder to make nice swooping flowing curves uh, initially, especially with a bowl gouge, but much easier to make one long sweeping smooth profile uh, with a bowl gouge. So either way, you'll get to where you're going. So we'll use both, okay? That's why I say I don't have a preference per se unless the shape dictates which one I want to use. Um, and I don't have a bias. I've used, I use them all, and I have found for me the strengths of the certain tools, and that's where I'll use that tool. I switch tools back and forth all day long. So I know that a lot of times there's you know, debates out there and controversy. People have opinions about shouldn't use carbide tools or scrapers, on, on, and on. It's a tool. It cuts. If it does what you need, for that particular task, that's the tool you should use. If it makes it the fastest, the easiest, the most productive for you, and you're happy with the results, that's what you should be using. Whatever tool works best. And I switch back and forth, uh, whatever one, and I'll throw, sometimes I'll throw one down, I won't be happy with it, and I'll change tools and I'll grab the other one. So don't get yourself caught up um, in, that, in that debate. Um, and since, I don't know what time it is, 10... 15 i haven't done i haven't done a, a reading i was going to tell you guys because I, I, we are selling hopefully selling some tools here today too and i know you got the email but i just want to remind you i'm just going to run down the discounts real quick uh to, to handle my salesperson obligation so you have to change hats real quick because uh, we're talking about hand tools all the hand tools in the store are a 15 percent discount with with the discount code uh, the hand tool sets, there's only a couple of them in there right now, uh, are 5%. Uh, the colorants you'll see later in the afternoon are 20% discounts. The wood finishes are 20% discounts. Chucks and jaws are 5%. Uh, the lathe accessories, which would be uh, like the steady rest, uh, the hollow roller bo boring system, uh, whatever is in the lathe, assist the lathe and accessories categories, uh, probably I did everything by category, so the step drives would be in there. Um, the wood stabilizing, we haven't even talked about that, but there's a 5% discount there. Casting resins will be on this afternoon. They're 10%. Shop supplies, uh, face masks, lens cleaners, uh, CA glue, they're all 10%. Uh, specialty tools, which is going to be some of the texturing tools, the airbrushes, um, they're 15%. And then the little hand sanitizer kits, which I'll talk about tonight. Uh, we brought those out when COVID first hit. And we've got a lot of left over. So those are 40% for all the components. If you're making bottle stoppers and key rings and things like that, you can save a whole bunch of money uh, there. So that was my pitch for this particular uh, stint. So let's go back to turning. Um, I think I will put you on the overhead camera. 
and we'll continue the shape of our little bowl here with the different tools. So, so far we've used a round tool, a round carbide tool. We've used, a, so a round carbide tool, a diamond shaped carbide tool, a square style carbide tool, a 5 8 inch bowl gouge, and a 3 8 inch bowl gouge. And also, uh, Carter and Son runs by the size of the shaft, whereas, say, Sorby runs by the size of the flute when they measure. Okay? Okay, so, let's do a little more work here. We're going to pick up our speed. We'll start with the round tool, carbide style tool. And we're just going to keep this simple today. I say, actually, I may do something not quite so simple after all. What I love about wood turning is you can just change your mind and do whatever you want. Okay, so now you can see, uh, it's really yellow in that camera, and I do apologize for that. I'll try and fix that later today. That we've got a, you know, a nice profile going here. You can see kind of the waves that I was talking about um, coming in the shape. So we'll switch over to the bowl gouge now. This is the Carter and Son, and these are our uh, M42 uh, High-speed steel with 10% cobalt. So we'll just follow that profile that we've already created. Right on up to the top there. And you can see that we don't have the waves now. Uh, that we had. Now we could have gone in with a radius cutter on a on a, on a carbide tool um, and and gotten the same effect, but I just I've got these tools right handy, um, so that's where I stopped. So that bottom, our tenon is ready right there. Um, we have a knot we just came to right here, and that overhead camera color is going to really annoy me, but I won't complain. So what I'm going to do at this point, when I'm going to take my goggles off. I'm gonna go ahead and take this off here now. Uh, I'm happy with the whole bottom profile. I wanna leave this in place, this little rim. We've got this knot here. I may make this recurve. So let's change gears. And we'll just unthread that super quick like that. Pop out our worm screw. So like I say, if you run the grub screw or the set screw on your chuck, um, you're going to really like using uh, worm screws. Because you don't have to take your chuck off. Now, in my chuck here, in my the gap in my jaws, although it's yellow, you can see here, I have just a very, very small gap right there. You can just barely see that little tool. So I have a perfect circle, which means that the jaws are touching all the way around perfectly, touching that entire tenon. And that's what I want. I don't want my jaws to be, and I'll use this chuck, find a key here real quick. Let um, me get to the overhead. Actually, I'll do it on the end. You can see better on the end because of the light. When my jaws are tight on the piece, I don't want them to be open like that with this big gap. As you can see how we don't have a perfect circle going around. So what's going to happen then, your jaws are only going to touch on the corner, each corner of the jaw. You're not going to get any contact in the center here. So that's why we always strive for that perfect circle. 
which is the dimension that the jaws were turned at, designed to grip at. And when we get right down there real close, now we want to make sure we don't get too small because then they won't grab. And we get right about there, give yourself an eighth or so. Then you have a nice perfect circle. And that gives you the best grip on your tenon. Or if you're making a recess, the same thing would expand out. That's going to be the best grip you can possibly get. And that's what you're after with your jaws to uh, touch your tenon. So I'm very pleased with that one. It's, it's real good. Now, this wood is soft. So I, I spent a few seconds there talking to you. And I cranked that down again because I know it's compressing these fibers. Okay. All right. So now I have a couple of things I can do here. I need to clean up the face. Clean up the face. And I have to think about what do I want to do. I could leave this little decorative band in here. Um, I was on the wrong camera there. We need to clean up the face there and here this decorative band i can leave i might leave this in place you, you know depending on what you want to do um the other thought i had and I, so i can show you some more tools i might curve this around make a recurve bowl and i think that's what i'm going to do now i got this knot right here and i think maybe what i'll do is just for fun today i'll put a narrow band in here and we'll recurve this so we'll do a little bit of each And let's see here. It is 10, okay, 1022. At 1030, which would be halfway between 9 and 12, at 1030, we're going to take a five-minute little restroom break. Um, I know I am, and I hope you will, too. Take that time. I'll just run to the house because uh, three hours is a long time, I think, in anybody's world. But let's get this face cleaned up. So let's do that first. Again, our choice of carbide or, or conventional tools, either one's going to do the job. Now we do have this little knot feature here we're starting to see. So we'll start with the carbide. You get things flattened out. If we don't have carbide, but we have a set of gouges. Come in with the tip and the wing, just draw right across. And that flattens your piece right out. Okay, now you have your nice flat top, uh, beautiful sycamore uh, quarter saw and flex right there. We got this knot right here. Um, you never know about those old knots coming in on you, but I think I I am going to make a put a recurve into this piece so that I can show you how to work reach around the corner with a curve style tool. So let's do that, and I will use the start with the round style tool in the carbide, go to the overhead, the yellow overhead camera. It's looking all yellow on me today. Get you the best contrast there. So this is what I, where these really shine. Cause I can stand back here. Let's say it was a, a piece that I might have a concern about. Uh, I can stand back over here far out of the way and make my cuts. Now, let me go to the end camera for you, and you'll see what I'm doing. So this round cutter allows me to come back and forth in here. Okay. So I don't have to turn the tool over and change directions. I can just go back and forth and back and forth. Now, we've got that knot there, a uh, big old hole now in there. You never know what you're going to find. So let's dig down in there and see what we've got. So I get out my number one tool that my father gave me, which is my ice pick. And we go exploring. Before we go any further, 
with our turning tools to see what we're what we've got here. So the theory that I had may or may not uh, hold water here now because this is is tearing away. We want to make sure that everything is solid. Anything that's loose is out of the way. As far as I'm concerned, you can't turn wood without an ice pick because it is the most handy tool. So this is a, a limb. This is an old limb. It looks like the limb was going through like that, and it has rotted down in here some. Okay. So that's going to kind of change my plan a little bit. And I hate to lose. I wanted to have some of this flat profile here. Let's see what we can do with this. So this little hole right here is going to is going to make an issue. But we will see what we can do. I'm going to stay with the carbide tool because I can I can stand back out of the way. And so still, I'm standing over here, and I'm working over here. All right. Now, of course, the beauty is. I can watch that monitor up there and I can see exactly what I'm doing. Out in front of me is, is a monitor with all the different camera angles. So you see how I can just go back and forth with this round cutter? It's really nice. For doing something like that. Let's see what we got going on in there. So we still got a little bit of that that guy there. We might just make a, won a wonky looking bowl, but we got an edge here that's bad. So let's go ahead and just turn that off. Sometimes you just don't get what you want. Okay, so we're starting to get rid of that ailment that we've got there. We've got kind of an interesting look here. All right. So let's do this. Let's change gears. I'm going to change it to the overhead because I'm going to put my head in the way here. I'm going to take a bowl gouge. I'm going to come, and I want to cut from the inside out. I want to cut downhill down with the fibers with my bowl gouge. And we're going to leave this as our potential opening. So one thing we have to be careful of here is that when we use a bowl gouge as we sweep around that we don't drag our heel of our tool right here I don't know where my pointer went we don't want to drag that heel and that's why we'll grind the heel away on our tool a lot so as i make this turn and come around this corner that heel doesn't drag a mark back behind it okay so we get a nice clean cut now i've got this wonderful pattern right here in my wood Okay, this is great looking wood in this piece of sycamore. Now, if I really want to um, see about getting that a little bit cleaner and not worry about the heel dragging, this is a sorby quarter, which would be three eighths in um, Carter and Son, and we have both. This has a more traditional grind to it. Uh, it looks you know, like it comes from uh, non sweat back, and it also has the heel ground away. So this type of profile lets me make this turn very easily and come around. Now, hopefully this is sharp. I haven't checked it since the last time I used it. But when we have the heel turned away, although I actually got a cleaner cut with my bigger tool today, 
Okay. That one might need to be sharpened up as dragging just a little bit. And then we can do whatever we want to with this profile. It's completely up to us. I'm just kind of fooling around and having a little fun here. Okay. So we can leave that. Kind of got a little volcano with the rim. If you don't know me, you don't know that I like to make strange things sometimes. I want to shorten this profile up just a little bit. Okay. Beautiful piece of wood. Absolutely gorgeous piece of wood. Now, the next thing that I want to do is we will go into curve tools. Uh, this is the easy wood tools. This is the number uh, three full size Oliver. It's got the slight curve in it. And I also want to get out. Where did my other one go? I have a number two floating around in here somewhere. Might be on the back side. Might have fallen down. Where did you go? You were here last time I saw you. They also come in the, in the pro size, but um, I'm looking for the smaller one. Well, we'll do it with the number three. We'll use the number three. And a number one hollower. Uh, when I come back here, we're going to take a quick break and, like, say five minutes. And I'll set up this is a number one hollower right now. It's got a negative rate cutter on it. I'm going to change it over to a standard cutter and we'll use that for going and starting to hollow inside our piece. And then we'll also use this curve tool to be able to reach around that corner. All right. And these carbide tools are great for that. So, Let's take a quick five-minute uh, restroom break. I'll run off. I'll be back in just a couple minutes. You guys do the same. Promise it won't take me very long, and it will be right back. So I will leave you with that end camera to look at that beautiful piece of wood there for just a minute, and I will see you right back here in just a couple.
Hi, Art. It's Sue.
Okay, we should be on our way back. Maybe I'll just stay out here on this nice sunny Georgia day. Okay. Ah, I hope everybody's well. I had a good little quick break there. Might have been more than five minutes. Okay. Art Miller driving in the car. I see you, buddy. I hope you're in the passenger seat. Um, my audio coming back through to you guys okay? Yes. Okay, good deal. Good deal. My wife told me that she didn't get the email to with the access code, and I, so I was taking a quick look in there to see what was going on with that. All right, let's change cutters here real quick. Since we haven't covered that uh, that function, we will change a cutter in the number one hollower. And again, this is where the ice pick comes in. You got to have an ice pick. And I'll do this. Uh, I'll do this in the end camera. The end camera's got the best look right now. So always clean out the screw because the last thing you want to do is strip out the screw holding your carbide cutter in place. Okay? So with the little wrench, make sure it's well seated in there and off we go. Now, if you're turning wet woods, turning green wood, always, always, always put some wax or some grease on the screw. Because the, the cutter won't rust, but the screw will. And the shaft is stainless steel, but the screws are not. So you'll end up with the screw rusting into the tool. And then you'll have a devil of a time getting it out. And they, they provide new screws with each cutter. And if, you, if you've used, taking the screw, if you've used it numerous times to um to rotate a cutter it's wise to go ahead and replace the screw just because it starts to get a little wallowed out on the inside there always make sure that you're clean underneath and always use the short end of the wrench you see here don't use the long end to Set the if you if you use the long, you put your wrench in like that and use the long end. You'll put too much torque and tighten the screw up so much that you won't be able to get it back out. So always make sure that it's sitting flat down inside and snug her right up. And if you ever have have a tool that starts doing something strange, one of these carbide tools, um, especially the smaller ones or any of the round, especially the round ones do it more than anything else. Sometimes the screw can actually work loose, okay? And it'll start cutting really strange and you'll, you won't know what in the world's going on. Check the screw and make sure that the screw uh, hasn't gotten a little bit loose because it'll make it jump around and vibrate and do all kinds of crazy things on you. And your standard cutters, like I just put on, your standard cutters can be sharpened on a diamond card. I think I've got one right here. So if you have a diamond card or go out and get one, one of these diamond cards, you can take the carbide cutters, put them the flat side down. It won't work on the negative rakes. Take the cutter, put it down, face side down, a little bit of lapping oil on there, and that will sharpen that cutter back up. Now, it won't make it as sharp as new, but it will make it uh, functional again. Very, very serviceable. Okay? So, number one hollower. We're going to come right inside here, and we're going to start to hollow this guy out. And then we'll use our curve tool to reach around the corner. All right. 
Safety glasses back on. Did anybody have any questions that came up with while I was uh, had run away there for a minute? Everybody's good? Okay, good deal. Off we go then. I always start out at a new speed. Since I've been talking, I want to make sure that I tightened. Sometimes I get to talking and forget to... There we go. Make sure that's tight. We'll turn about a thousand RPMs here. People always ask, how do you know when a carbide cutter is dull? Well, when you start working with a brand new cutter, after a couple of times, uh, you'll realize what sharp is, and then when you notice that it doesn't cut like it used to, that's how you know. These things cut really, really well. And so I can just drive right down through the middle of this. You can see how quick this is going. Okay, let's stop and we'll check our depth without even getting fancy. We'll just take our finger. And so we're just past the center mark there. Double check that again. Okay, I don't, this is actually fairly shallow back here on the back. Uh, let me go to overhead for you. This is fairly shallow on the back. So I don't, I want to make sure that I don't overdo it. You can see I don't have a lot. Uh, down there so to be safe I don't want to cut through though I have a tendon on here so I have a little bit of margin but what I'll do is I'll switch over now to the curve style tool okay so with these tools and this is the larger um, this is now called the go back up here for a second this is a, an old version this is the number three full size hollower the number three full size has been turned into the number three pro. Okay. There's the, the midsize um, series and there's the pro series. They have done away with the midsize number three. So if you've got one of these, uh, you've got a, a rare one. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great size. I've had this one for years. Um, it's actually my favorite one. It has a thicker shaft to it. But what we want to do is we want to be sure we back up to where our tool rest is sitting on the flat section here. And I'm gonna start with the tool rest fairly far away, right in there. And now this will allow me to reach in around the corner. And if I show you in the yellow overhead as well, I'll be able to reach inside that corner just like that. Okay, so I can reach around. Now, yes, I could come over here with a straight tool and do this, but that's very awkward, a uh, long way to reach. So much easier. Like so. Now, one of the key things with this tool is always try and cut right here on the very end you don't want to be cutting over here. It will tend to make the tool catch and vibrate. Obviously, you can't really cut here. You can if you pull back. Um, same thing. Always try and cut out here on the very end. Just rotate the tool so that's what you're cutting with. Now, this is a full size, which uses the number threes, um, and the mid size uh, use the number five, the CI5. The slightly smaller radius.
Now we also have a Hollow Master from Sorby, and I don't know that I have one here. I'm looking to see if I brought a Hollow Master here. Uh, same principle. It works with a, uh, a high-speed steel cutter. It's not carbide. And I don't have one here on the rack. Um, we do have it uh, in, on the site in the hand tools, um, but I don't have one here with me. So I'm, I can feel this wall. And speaking of uh, things, a set of calipers. And we have the calipers from Sorby, the, met the measuring calipers. So these are a great way. If you want to see what your wall thickness is, let me turn this around so you can see how that works. So I can see what my wall thickness right there is. Yeah, so that's a nice, a nice thickness there. That's nice and workable. You see my finger. And then as we go down, we see it gets thicker. Okay. So these are a great way to check, keep your wall thicknesses uniform. Real handy. Make sure my tool rest is in the right place. Continue on with our project here. Again, this is real easy. You can see that I'm back here working. So the tool, tool's doing all the work. I'm up out here. Again, just a couple of fingers on the tool. Not, you don't need any kind of death grip going on here. And you'll see that I rotate the tool around to come down into the bottom. Let me show you that from the overhead. So if I start up higher up on the piece, tool is up here, clean that off. As I come down the wall, and then as I go to the bottom, I let the tool sweep. So you see the tool is pivoting around that axis. So we're always cutting with the best part of the tool. And then there's always a little nub that forms in the center. So this style uh, tool makes quick work uh, of your Halloween projects. So that's nice and thin right up here on the top. I'm going to go back over to the end for you here. Uh, that's a nice wall all the way right down to here. Now, I do want to take some more of the bottom out, and I'm actually better off to take the bottom out with the straight tool again, give myself a little more depth. What makes the number one hollower unique is that you can see the taper. It's got the small cutter so we can control uh, how much resistance we're putting. The tool tapers up, flares up, and then we have a very thick shaft. Compare that to even the standard tool, okay? So a much thicker shaft on this hollower so we can reach further inside. And you'll find uh, most people who work with the Easywood tools this is their this number one hollower is their favorite tool of, from Easywood Tools. Okay. Clean that out. Once you get uh, comfortable hollowing, it's a great it's a great fun uh, pr way to turn and projects to make. Because they're they're unique. People go, how'd you get inside there? And this is a large hole. You can go in through a, a pretty small diameter hole. I'm gonna back this up just a fuzz more. So the brunt of the work I need to do now is out in this region, out in here. And again, using a curve tool like this, very easy, very stress-free. Always making sure to keep the tool flat on the tool rest. And just keep that all bl nicely blended together.
and stop frequently and check and see if you're doing what you want. And that's coming out really nice. Okay, a little bit further, I need to go out here between these two points. So we'll do a little bit more. Okay, I think that's about what we want to do there. For this piece, yep. I'd say that's just about what we want to do. So for, for hollowing, like we've just done, we really only used the two tools, a number one hollower and a number uh, three. In this case, it's a number three full size. There is a number two uh, full size. It's got the same profile, but it's just a smaller uh, smaller overall tool, uh, same principle. And then the full size or the pro size are a, a much larger tool, okay? For most of your smaller work, you're gonna wanna stay with the smaller tools. Uh, there is a, a, a number or a, Straight pro hollower now too. Uh, I helped test that with Easywood back last year. Uh, it works really well. It's a, it's a big tool. For your smaller work, you can stay with the smaller tools uh, and do really, really well. So these guys are great for that. I do wish I had brought the Sorby in, uh, the Sorby Hollow Master. Uh, I thought I had one in here. I looked at it, one at the warehouse this, this morning and didn't grab it. Um, so uh, I didn't have one. But we're going to stop on that. Uh, for this, because I want to switch over to a little bit of spindle turning. Does anybody have any questions about working with the bowl gouges, the hollowing tools, and the carbide tools in the realm of um, making bowls or, or little hollow forms? Any kind of questions? Fire away, because I'm going to change things up here a little bit. How are the mini hollowers? How are the mini hollowers? These little guys right here, they're great. Uh, on real small projects, okay? They have a straight one, they have a 45, and they have a 90 uh, with a real small shaft. Now, they the small projects, and they come equipped with the negative rate cutter to be a little bit less aggressive because you have such a, a smaller profile here. You don't want the tool to want to catch easily. So they come with an, uh, 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 a negative rake, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it on a piece even this big because I can do it easier and better with the bigger tool. But if I, maybe I would say I was working on this little guy, that would probably be my better choice for getting inside something this small. Then I would go with these little guys. Now uh, they, they work well. Just, I mean, they're, they're cool. And they run the smaller cutters, less resistance. Uh, and you can put the standard cutters if they're not cutting fast enough for you with the supplied negative rate cutters, just put a standard uh, CI-5 cutter on them and you can move more wood. So if the wood is really soft, especially, you'll probably think it's taking too long. And so experiment, put a, a standard CI-5 on and as long as it's not too grabby for you, um, you'll move a lot more wood real fast. If the wood is hard um, or you're trying to have real good control, super, something super thin, you might want to stay with the negative rakes. Um, they, they work well. They're just not. Uh, you can't. You can't quite muscle them as much. You can't be quite as brutal with them. Like, I know I can lean on those others pretty hard because you've got that big flat surface to work with to, for stability. These are a little more sensitive, but then again, they're for smaller projects. So in in the smaller projects, they really do. They work great. They're they're fantastic, and they come in a kit of the three, or you can buy them individually. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's pop this guy out. So there's our little, we'll save this for something. Who knows, I'll probably color this this afternoon. Uh, we'll do something with it. It's a fun little piece. 
beautiful piece of wood. I might just leave it natural too because the uh, the coloring uh, is going to be yellow on that. I'm going to go to the end. I want to show you this a little focus uh, with the light. It's got some wonderful grain in it. The light kind of washes it out a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Try not to sneeze into the microphone. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's take a chuck off. Um, or not. Some people, you know, if, if you're strictly a spindle turner, um, you don't necessarily use a chuck. So let's do this because we know we pretty much all know about having a a spur drive, four prong spur drive. Um, I, I honestly, I seldom use them. I do have some around somewhere. Uh, you know, if you if you're not familiar with the four prong spur drive, it comes with your lathe, comes with every lathe. Okay. Um, if you're going to go that, that route, I would, I would recommend, uh, the step drives, whether it's a step drive or a M2 taper, uh, step drive, you have all these teeth, um, and the spring loaded, uh, center section for lining up your stock. If you want to, I'm just kind of a fan because I, I've always been more of a bowl turner than a spindle turner. I'm kind of a fan of leaving my chuck on the lathe. And chucking my spindle work up into my chuck. Now this says poplar on it, 32010. So it probably is poplar, which would mean it's fairly soft. And the reason I've always done it this way, and again, it's me, is because being more of a bowl turner, vessel turner, I never wanted to take my chuck off if I didn't have to. That's just how I, how I am. So we'll get that locked in between centers there real nice. And make sure she turns well. There we go. Kind of in that yellow there. And then you can see we're right between centers in the chuck. With my tail stock, and we are we are good to go. And I'll tighten that up one more time. So now it's time for our spindle roughing gouge. And I have the Carter and Son Toolworks. And one of the things I want to show you about a Carter and Son Toolworks roughing gouge that is it is fantastic. We also do carry. Uh, the Sorby spindle gouges. And if, if budget is an issue, uh, the Sorby is a wonderful tool. If you want the most robust tool steel in a roughing gouge, it's pretty hard to beat the three quarter inch shaft on this spindle gouge. Super stout, super solid. Okay, it's it, it's a wonderful tool. Their machining is is superb. You can actually hear if you hear the pop popping out of there. Uh, their Carter and Son Toolworks their machining is fantastic. The tools uh, stay sharp for a long, long time. Okay, but I am going to show you a different tool that you might not have heard of after we get this guy uh, roughed down a little bit. And, that, and it is a, it's a Sorby tool, and it's called a Spindle Master. Spindle. Got my, my, my voice is cracking a little bit here today. 
Okay, so I think probably I'm going to leave you in the overhead, even though it's yellow, for this. I think we'll come on down and get the whole length down here. Yep, it does look like poplar. Indeed it does. Quite soft. And what we're going to do is turn this around in a second. Okay. And just because we want to have some fun, let's go ahead and use our step drive in our truck. I just like a little more grip when I first start out. So one of the beauties here is I can, I can set this, and you can see I can be way off. And so with the step drive, that's why I did it this way. If you need to adjust, you push in against, I'm pushing to the left to push in against the step drive and it allows me to move and recenter the other end. Now granted, if I had started between centers, it would have stayed there in, in the first place. But if you're just working with something different, It's kind of handy. I'm just trying to show you as many different things today as I possibly can. So this will be a little bit out of true. But not horribly. And we'll just clean up the last end here. Now, in case you missed me saying earlier that I am not a spindle turner per se, uh, I have played with it, I messed with it. It's not an area I spend much time, 
Um, I'm not, and I will raise my hand, I'm not proficient with a skew. Um, it's just something that I haven't had the need to or taken the time or made the time. I should, in my spare time sometime, uh, get much more proficient with the skew. Um, but I haven't. Which brings me to uh, what I think is probably the, the, the next best, easiest thing to work with. And this is called the uh, Spindle Master from Sorby. The very simple tool. I'll show you here in a close-up on the end. It's just a flat tool with a bevel on the bottom. Okay. And all we do to sharpen it, we don't ever mess with the bevel. We want to polish this bevel every once in a while. But all we ever do, let me get my diamond card back out that I had out earlier. All we want to do is take a, a diamond card or diamond hone. And I'm going to put a little fluid on there. And bring this back over where you can see it. And with the tool upside down, this is all we do to sharpen the tool. Is just run it on a diamond card or or hone stone, whatever your whatever your method is. These are super simple, super easy. All right, and that's all you have to do to, to uh, sharpen it back up. That's all the maintenance there is to it. It's it's pretty cool. And then the most important thing about this tool, and let me see, I'm gonna be working on the end. Let me see if I can't, I'm gonna change this camera down here. I'm gonna pull it down to the end. I've changed it over for a second. A little bit more, there we go. There we go. Much better. Um, you don't want to engage the very tip, okay? You always want to be cutting out on one of the shoulders. Where's my little pointer? Or you always want to be cutting out on one of the shoulders more so than the very tip, okay? And we're going to let our bevel rub along in on behind. And you will get a super clean cut. You won't have any torn fibers. Give myself a little more speed here. So the, the smooth, shiny bevel back on the bottom side is actually kind of burnishes the wood as you go. And so you, you get a wonderful finish right there, uh, straight off the tool. Now this poplar is really soft. Uh, got a little divot in it right there. But that is, is really, really, really smooth. No torn grain whatsoever. So again, if, if you're not a skew master, but you need to do uh, a, a quick table leg or something, and... You know, you don't have the time to invest uh, in in mastering that skew. I mean, I think it's a tool that we should all learn to use. But this is simple and easy to work with, and with a little practice, there's not a profile pretty much in spindle turning that you can't make with it. It's inexpensive. Again, the high-speed steel, 
you just keep your diamond card handy and just a couple of strokes every once in a while to sharpen that right back up. And then we can change this profile. We can do whatever we want to here. Very easy tool to work with. Uh, let me do one more run down through here. It really doesn't get much more simple. Uh, let's see if I can't cut you another profile. I know you're looking at the end here. I want to cut you a profile that's got an edge to it. So that you can see a crisp edge. There we go. So that top edge needs to be clean. Is I didn't take all the whole top away, but you get a, a wonderful clean cut. Any any profile you want to do um, in your traditional spindle work, right there is super easy. So if we want to take the sharp and roll this over in a traditional. That's when the tip touches. You see how that tip touched there? And that's the only time that it'll really grab or catch. So as long as you don't let that tip touch, you're in good shape. So that's a Sorby Spindle Master. Great little tool. They're in a uh, half inch and um, three quarters. Great little tool. I started using this last year uh, out of the woodworking shows. Uh, Sorby is sponsor for us at the woodworking shows. And we were giving these away as our weekly giveaway. Uh, so I played with it uh, every week. Great little tool. Again, inexpensive, 50, 60 bucks. And only sharpening is up on the top there. Pretty cool. Uh, I've really been happy with that. Uh, next spindle gadget I've got over here. Where are my... Carter and Son spindle gadgets. I've hidden them from myself. How could I have done that? I don't know. But they were here recently. I have been moving some things around. So what may I have done with them? I didn't have a chance to get all the tools organized out here this morning. So that does become a question for me. Oh, maybe I put them in my toolbox. Wouldn't that be a novel concept? Okay. It looks like I did. That's I was changing handles around. That's what the deal is. So, and I think I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave the camera right where it is and, and show you a couple of the different spindle gadgets before I have a handle on them. Uh, this one I'll show you. And, and this is this uh, Carter and Son double ended, right? So one end is a detail gouge, detail spindle gouge that you see here. Okay. This is their uh, Werner double ended. And when we flip it over, the other end is a bowl gouge. So you have a bowl gouge on one end and a detailed spindle gouge on the other. Pretty handy in, in one piece of in one piece of steel. Pop up here. You can see what I'm talking about. Goes in your handle either way. Uh, great tool, super handy for having one tool, one piece of steel investment. 
that can be two tools. So if you're looking to try out the, the M42 high-speed steel and you wanted a spindle gouge and a bowl gouge, great way to go. Order one of these up. You get one of each. And put your preferred grinds on them. Super handy way to go right there. Put that guy here. Um, the next one is their detail gouge. And that's actually, uh, this is actually the low profile 3 8 It's not the detail gouge either. Uh, I misspoke there. They do have the low profile series. And here is a half inch low profile. And you can see how they've they've cut them down here in the profile. So that uh, some some people like the low profile, some people like the the, the standard size. Now this is a a five eighths that I don't know that they make anymore. Um, I haven't seen it listed. I need to ask them about it. Um, I do have this one around as well. I was hoping that I had one in the handle. I'll put I'll throw one in the handle uh, to be sure. That's not a big deal. We'll just change one of these out real quick. Does anybody have any kind of questions about the Spindle Master while I'm changing out the Carter and Son tool handle? No? Everybody's good on that? Anybody have any questions? This guy's in there. Um, about the Carter and Son tools here. You hear that pop right out of there? So because this handle I decided to grab has the insert in it, their handles now, all the tools um, use a, an insert. And this one happens to have the 3 8 insert in it. So I'll just use the little 3 8 spindle gouge here. We're all set there. Okay. Spindle gouge is one. Like I said, I'm not a spindle turner. I have a ball playing with them, uh, learning to get better. I love to spend time with it. And because I haven't, this is one of the things about the different tools, working with the different hand tools. Uh, sometimes you get them at, if you're in a club and, and somebody might be selling some stuff off and there's a tool that you're not used to, but it comes up cheap, go ahead and, and get it. Buy, buy the next tool that you haven't learned to use. And with me, with spindle turning, I don't have any spindle projects that I need to make. So when I'm when I'm turning in spindle work, I'm just exploring and the, um, discovering, having fun uh, working with the tool. And it's I actually find it very very relaxing because usually it's something else I'm making. I've got to I've got to do it, and it's, it's got some purpose. When I start playing here on a spindle turn and with the spindle gadgets, I just kind of go explain or exploring and playing with the cuts. Uh, I take my time looking for how the, the tool works and how the angles work, because it is very different than being a bowl turner. Uh, so it's it's really rewarding in that regard. Uh, when I started turning 12, 14 years ago, I had no interest in spindle turning whatsoever, and I, I didn't really pick them up. I mean, I've always had one, but I never used it. So it's a fun area for me to explore. And what I love about the Carter and Son tools is I sharpen them, and I don't use them that much. They stay sharp. Um, so they're probably pretty sharp now. If not, I'll jump over on the grinder. The grinder is over here to the side, uh, out of the way. But we'll just play with the spindle gouge a little bit. If you got questions, please holler at me about it, um, or anything else for that matter. And I'm going to keep you on that end camera, because that's the best place that you can see right now. And it's 11.30, I'm always amazed at what a clean, fine cut you get with a nice sharp tool.
And like I say, with, with this high speed uh, M42 high speed steel with the cobalt in it, they stay sharp for the longest time. Now this poplar, like I said, is really soft. And the other thing I need to do, because I'm trying to actually do something halfway nice here, is my tool wrist is just a little bit rough. And if you're not familiar with this technique, a flat file, take a flat file, and file the nicks out of that tool rest. And always be sure that you do the entire rest. Because otherwise you'll file a U-shape into it over time. And this is just a stock factory tool rest. I don't know if this came off the jet or the Colt. Um, I interchange them around. Okay. And again, nice, super easy, clean cuts. It is fun for me just to experiment. And another thing I, you know, just from uh, project perspective, uh, I've never done finials per se. And so I haven't done a lot of the finial work with the spindle gouges. But this is where I practice in. One day I'll start to do finials. But you find that there's not much of a shape that you can't create. And I'm fooling around right here. Okay. Now, I've been playing with the Sorby Spindle Master and the Carter and Son spindle gouges. Now, what if you have carbide tools and you want to do spindle turning? So we need to cover that ground. Okay. So with the carbide tools, we still have the same profiles. We have the round profile, square profile, and the diamond profile. And we can do virtually all the same work that we can do with our spindle gouges and our spindle roughing gouge in the carbide tools. So the square tool or the roughing tool, that takes the place or represents our spindle roughing gouge. The round tool basically represents our spindle standard spindle gouges, uh, depending on whether it's uh, the mid-size with the CI3 or a micro with the CI-5 uh, cutters on them. Let me change over here. So when it comes to our coves, obviously we can't make a cove smaller than the radius of the cutter. So the CI-3 is the midsize, the CI-5 is the smaller, uh, it's in the number one hollower and in the micros, and that's as small as the round cutters go. But you can make a perfect cove with that. Now, if you need, a profile of that nature, but you need something different, then work with the uh, CI4, the detail cutter. And the, the standard CI4 has a slightly rounder tip to it, much more so than the CI7. You see the CI7 has the real pointed tip and the CI4 has the more rounded tip. Now, the CI7 is going to give you a super crisp little uh, fine light cut. So that doesn't mean there's not a place for it, 
but it just depends on what you're doing. So these replace um, our skew tip. If you're using a skew to get that fine, fine line, you're going to probably use uh, the detail cutters to make that same type of a cut. Now, we've already got this rough, but I'll, I'll just hit it with the rougher as if that's all we had. And we wanted to get this cleaned up a little bit more. Again, I'm going to make sure that my tool rest is at the cutting at the center height for the tools. So I was a little bit high there. There we go. We want to be pretty well right at center here. And I'm going to work on that overhead camera for later today because of the color. So I'm still better off staying on the end camera for you just because of the colors. This is this this yellow overhead is so yellow, um, it's pretty hard to see anything. So we're much better staying off right here. So this will be our spindle roughing gouge. As you can see, I cut laterally there. And so I'm using the front cut, front edge as my guide, and I'm cutting with the left hand side in that case. And so I can tape, make this a taper cut. Very easily. Okay. Now let's say I want to roll that into a uh, corner over. This is a negative rate cutter, but just it, we're not going very far. So it's okay. Now what I have to be careful of is right here, as I get down to the bottom with this round cutter, I can't quite get all the way down unless I cut back a little bit because I start to hit my other piece. So we do have to compensate for that. Okay, and then we can blend that right in. All right. Um, if we wanted to make just a standard uh, cove somewhere right in here, let's put a cove right in the middle of this, cr this crown for the moment. Super easy. Now, one thing to keep in mind with these round cutters, once you load them to a full 180 degrees, uh, they'll tend to vibrate. So you want to stay just a little bit shy of the full 180. Um, I don't have this completely loaded. You might notice me kind of rocking the tool back and forth a little bit. Glad that we can't see you. And I know you can't quite see that, so I'm going to put another one of these right in here where you'll be able to see it better. And if I want a smaller, tighter radius. Wrong camera, Bradley. What's that? Wrong camera. Wrong camera. Oh, thank you, Art. Somebody got to watch out for me. Uh, where was I at? Here. So I want to make a smaller radius. I just used a smaller tool. Now, if I want something even more detailed than that, Let's say we want to make some type of a, a, a groove detail in here. With a chamfered edge. The nice round nose on this is nice and, and easy to control. Okay. And I know you can't quite see that in the overhead. It wouldn't have shown up 
there. Anyway, this, if I use the, the real detailed tool, and I'm going to come in here and put a real detailed line right in the top of that section. So that's the beauty of the really pointed tool. If you want to do something real detail oriented, you can come in and put a fine line somewhere in your piece. With that fine, fine tip. Okay, now that's the goofiest looking thing I've ever seen. Um, but it, it serves its purpose. So also the radius cutter, let's say you were having a little trouble here. Uh, in in this this section, and I know it's a little far away in the camera, but if I use the radius cutter, if I had cut that with a round cutter, that radius cutter allows me to clean that right up. So we can do the same. We can get all the same different profiles, create the same profiles uh, with either tool style, be it uh, conventional style tools with the spindle gouge and the spindle roughing gouge, or be it with the carbide tools with the rounds, the squares, and, and the pointed tools. Uh, so it leaves you uh, a lot of options. And then again, like I say, uh, this one is, is kind of in between. It's, and again, super easy to use. So a lot of different ways that we can get our spindle profiles uh, depending on uh, what your budget is, what your skill set is. Again, uh, say somebody like me who's turned bowls all the time and I needed to make four table legs. I would rather use maybe a, a spindle master um, and my spindle gouge. I'm comfortable enough with that and before I picked up a skew and I get my, my legs done and my project on, you know, finished up and on down the road. Uh, so lots of ways we can get there um, with the various sets of tools. So lot, lots of latitude there. And it's about 20 till 12. And we're still talking tools um, and chucks. So let me switch gears here. And we're going to talk about bowl jaws and chuck jaws a little bit more. Are there any questions in, that I can cover in the last topic here with working with the... Uh, Spindle tools or the spindle style turning with the carbide tools. Anybody got anything that's that's calling out to them? Or everybody's all good? Everybody's all good? Uh, Brian, Brian raised his hand. Can you, can you unmount? There you go. Yeah. Was, was the last tool you used the uh, square radius? The yes, the last tool was the square radius. Okay. Um, it's actually a negative rake, uh, just because that's what's on there. But that's what it was. The the Is square it... radius. I'm I'm trying to get them. They do not have easy wood. It does not yet have a negative rake square. They only have the negative rake in the square radius. And I keep pushing them for a negative rake square when I'm doing my resin turning. There's times when I want a square corner, square shoulder, um, and you can't get it in the negative rake with the radius cutter. So you end up using the detail tool, the pointed tool, the CI7 in a negative rake to cut, cut those shoulders that you want. So I'm always asking them for something. But yes, that last tool was the square cutter on a radius with the radius and that is the strangest little profile um but hey it's a lot of fun and this poplar is really soft <laughs> so if you go go to home depot or, or lowe's to buy stuff don't buy a piece of poplar at least the, this one but hey it served its purpose today um okay one thing i haven't shown you and we haven't talked about is in our chucks, we can have uh, additional jaws, bowl jaws, jumbo jaws, to hold something after the fact. And, and I have the easy wood tools ones here because that's what goes on the easy chuck. They call them the big easy jaws. 
if you need a way to hold a piece after the fact, if you've turned it and you just want to get the tenon off or you want to sand it, the bottom, whatever it is you might want to do, this is the way to go. I've got so many tools up here now that I need. One that I'm certain I buried. Let me put a few of these away. Do a little house cleaning. Just kind of stack them up out of the way over here. God knows what we might need next. Get down to where I can see things. Okay. So what I was looking for is not there. So that means it's back over here. As you'll see, popping these jaws out. Oh, you can't see it. I zoomed in too much now. Uh, popping these jaws out is super easy. That is the thing with the easy chuck when it comes time to change jaws. It takes no time at all. And I'm going to go fix that end camera so that you can see what we're up to again. So we'll change it while we're, we're in this mode now. There we go. All right, there we go. So you have your urethane bumpers and of course the jaws open and close. Now, Mr. Art Miller, who should be floating around in there somewhere, he always asks me, don't you, Art, if they have to be yellow, black, yellow, black, and I say, absolutely. I just don't do it. Uh, the bumpers are adjustable, movable. It's a law, you it's know. It's a law. Yes, it's a law. And I don't have all the pieces and parts. Um but also, along with the, the cone-shaped bumpers, is uh, the long-reach bumper. So, like, say, if you have a, a hollow form um, or something you just need more grip with, um, then you can use these. Another thing that I use these for is if I have a piece that has a... Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can explain this. Um, if I have a piece that is, is flat... And then it has a little bump out, some kind of little detail that I've, I've got. Uh, it's happened to be more of my resin pieces than anything else. And I need to hold it, but I can't have the very, like a prong sticking out. I can't have it touch. I will set it up to where it will sit. The piece will sit on the bumpers like so. Uh, go here in the overhead for the best I can show you. Have it sit up on a bumper. You can see that that one's black. I'll put it on this yellow one over here. And then I'll actually hold it with the long ones, which you can't see there either. I'm going to have to fix that camera. It's annoying the devil out of me. Uh, but I will grip them with these long ones. And so my piece of wood is not sitting on the metal. It's actually sitting on the bumpers. I use them as a standoff. Uh, it works quite well. Okay, so... Let me figure out what I want. I'm going to grab something else, not that little piece. Something else here that has... I'm bound to have something floating around here that I need to take a tenon off of. Ah, this is a good one. Let's take the tenon off. No, uh, yeah. Nah. This will, this will uh, disappear and look weird. It, you, it'll turn green on you. Uh, you'll see black is what you'll see as tools because of the chroma key. And now I just need to find one other wrench. To move my bumpers. Here it is.
This piece may not be my best choice. I may end up grabbing something else. Oh, I think that'll. I think this will go down small enough. Yes. Okay. So we're going to set the bumpers all the way in. Give myself a little room to work here. And we'll reach inside this piece to hold it. And no, I'm not going to change them to yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. It's a law, you know. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't follow all the laws. Imagine that. Elaborate, Mr. Miller. Hi. <laughs> they got to be yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. You can't have black, black, yellow, black. Is that just for the OCD among us? <laughs> That's for the OCD among us. I've actually had people out at the woodworking shows ask me that in a, as a serious question, and I didn't know what to, uh, how to respond without being my smart Alex self. I see that I missed that one. But these, once you get them you know, adjusted. I've used, them, I've used those out of the, uh, that sequence for oddly shaped natural edge bowls. Yes, you can do that. You don't have to be in a perfect circle. Uh, if you've got something that's a goofball shape, uh, you can do whatever. There's a lot of flexibility that you can get into with these. I'm just hoping that this is going to let me go. I thought that would go inside there, but it's not going to. And, and, and by the way, that's really tough on us OCD people. That's not quite going to go in there. So I do have to find another piece after all. Allow me to look around the treasure trove here and see what I can find without having to go far away or change everything. Yeah, you could change the jaws, put a smaller jaw in there. I could. I just want to show you how they grip. Of course, you probably, this will, I went too far, so now it's too big. I can't win today all of a sudden on that one. No matter what I grab, it's the wrong size. Yeah, that's because you don't have them yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, you're, you're probably right, Art. You know? And, of course, I've got 500 bowls over there at the house on the deck. But I don't have them here where I have something close at hand. Let's see. Let's see if I can do something with this or not. No, I can't win no matter what I do today without moving these. Just can't win. So, one more time around the sun. I really appreciate everybody coming by today, and uh, I hope you're enjoying it and picking up some tips and learning about the tools. And I hope you come back this afternoon when we start playing with colors and all kinds of fun stuff like that. I hope that the feed has been doing well, hasn't been dropping out. And all those things. And I hope that you're going to be joining us for the woodworking shows coming up here starting in February. This is a bit of a dry run for using this Google platform uh, for some external extraneous uh, presentations for me with the woodworking shows during that time. We use this platform every Thursday night in the Monday Methods uh, Wooden Resin Turning Group, which is a Spidercraft uh, group on Facebook. And, and we use this platform and we've had, it's worked great. 
I know a lot of the world uses Zoom, and I have Zoom, uh, but I also I use uh, the Google Work Suite for all of my my office business stuff. So I've already got it, and no need to pay for um, Zoom when I have I'm gonna have this. There we go, perfect. Representation is all we need. Is that one bumper out of place? Probably. No. Yeah, it should be yellow anyway. Yeah, you're right. You're killing me, Art. <laughs> you're going to kill me, Art. <laughs> see, I can't see from the end like you guys can without looking up there. I was just seeing if you're on your toes. I knew it was a test. Yes. I like to... I would have. I, like I would have failed the miserably. lines around. There's another one that's out. Yeah, you I didn't like catch that one. I like to follow the lines around when I'm changing those darn things. You know, as, as much as the pain it is, it seems to change those bumpers. It's a whole lot better than the closest alternative. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to leave it where it is. I'm not going to change them off. I'm actually off by a couple of them. But it's going to do what I want it to do. Anyway, um, this is not a high rate of speed kind of event. Uh, the maximum they rate it for. <laughs> That's nice. I can, I can what what is work. that? We're going to do some off-center work here. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing some off-center work. I actually have a wobble check here. <laughs> I just can't. I can never now you're get killing me. I love it. I love it when it goes crazy. Anyway, you get the idea. I'm not going to screw with this too much. Fool with it. Um, the bumpers, your bolt, your bowl goes in there. Put the bumpers in a true circle. Again, it helps if you look at them um, and see what you're doing instead of trying to uh, just talk at the same time. But the bumper jaws, the bowl jaws, they work well. They hold the piece. Super it's a simple. Good tool. All you got to do is get the bumpers in the right spot. And you're you're in good shape. And again, because it's the easy chuck, they pop in and out so that you can quickly get them out of the way and stop embarrassing yourself. <laughs> Which I do on a regular basis, and, and I'm actually okay with that. You know, I got over it a long time ago. Um so nonetheless, bowl jaws, super jumbo jaws, coal jaws, whatever you want to call them. Um, you can buy the bumpers individually. Uh, both the urethane, the cone ones, we have the cone ones, and we have the, the long ones. You can get both of those um, as extra sets if you need to run extras or do crazy things uh, with them. Is we that can do the 16-inch well. or the 14-inch? That's the 12-inch. I also have a 16 in the cabinet, but if I raise my hand and I'm honest, I'm missing one jaw. And how I've lost one jaw in here, I have no idea. That's actually kind of a joke. Because uh, what what you can't see in here, the piles, um, and then there is an extension. So on the 16 inch jaw set, you can buy an extension for 20 inches to take you out to 20 inches on that. Uh, so you can really grab a big piece. Um, again, this will probably turn some kind of crazy color because of the chroma key, but you could do a big bowl like this. Um, easily with the extensions okay i don't know what that looks like in, in on your end if i go overhead and i turn it that way turn off that it should look like the bowl so this is we'll be working with this this afternoon this is the rustina uh, metallic metallic paint we'll be working on this uh, which should be fun because it's all kind of green and i'm running a, a chroma key event here which makes things turn whatever the background is Nobody has asked me about the fact uh, about the tools on the wall. Hey, Bradley, what about yeah. the tools on the wall? Well, I don't know if you can tell. I don't know what it looks like live, but you see how the tools are really smooth? Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing there. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a beautiful display, by the way. 
yeah, that's from the this summer. Uh, I, I thought on short notice, why bring the, the crate in here when I had a picture from the Wood Turners Worldwide event that I was in with the, the same event where I actually had the, the tools back there. And I thought, well, I'll just chroma key it onto the wall and we'll go from there. So this was my first test. It also gives me another foot of space in here. So that's why this is part of the test. I may run and I'm looking for feedback if it looks okay um, from a visual standpoint. Uh, you know, I have the tools off to the side, um, but as, just as a backdrop, I'm not, the key needs a little bit of the chroma key needs a little bit of tuning. There's probably a little bit of fuzz around me today because uh, I don't have it dialed in with this different color background uh, being darker like that and the multiple colors like the uh, Carter box down here is probably a strange color. And, and I'm not seeing myself in real time, so I'm not sure what, what it's looking like. I, I need think to, it looks fine. I need to put another turn on another one of these seven monitors in here um, and see that. But it looks like we're rolling up right up on noon. So uh, any kind of questions from this morning as three hours? It's been a great time. I've had a ball and looking forward to coming back out at one and playing with colors. But if anybody has any kind of questions, I'd love to take them right now before we take a break for an hour and go have some lunch. Just a quick one. Your yeah, Thursday sure. night, what link is that for the uh, coloring? Resume? Thursday night, um, are, you have to be a member of the, of the group, the wooden res, wood the Monday Methods Wood and Resin Turning Group. Which I have changed the hours. Oh, uh, thank you, Bart. See, Art's going to be my producer yet. Um, the link gets put in on Thursday nights in the, on the member page. Wh which page is that? Because I'm on the Monday Methods. Okay, so are you on the Spirecraft Monday Methods Wood and Resin Turning Group page? No, just the Monday Methods at 11. Yeah, okay, get that's, request in. we'll get you in. Yeah, that that's just uh, a notification for Monday Methods, which typically starts today, at, uh, Mondays at 11 and runs till 1. What you're looking for is a, an actual group, a Facebook group that's called Monday Methods Wood and Resin Turning Community. And just ask to join, and, and either Art or myself uh, will pop you right in there. And then on Thursdays, you'll see uh, a couple of posts and it'll have a Google Meet image. And then in about quarter to seven, we meet at seven o'clock. At quarter to seven, I put the, the link up and then people pop in. And it's essentially just like this. I got the lathe here and we talk about whatever we did on Monday, uh, whatever I did on Monday methods and anything else that anybody might have uh, questions for. It's just a nice one on one hour long chat on a Thursday night uh, to answer any kind of questions that I can help folks with. So on the Facebook there, look for the Monday Methods Wood and Resin Turning Community. Yep, it works. Okay. Just ask for it, uh, membership. I did indeed. Thank you. Well, well, good deal. See, Art, Art's out there roving around somewhere. Art, Art uh, graciously volunteered to help me uh, monitor that group, and I appreciate it greatly because Art knows uh, I'm a one-man show uh, with all this. And sometimes I just don't have enough hands or eyes or sleep or something. <laughs> okay, I'll give Super it a try. Man. Yeah, we'll let you right in there, Don. Well, okay, everybody, take a break. I hope you come back this afternoon for playing with color. And I will see you then. And we'll go from one to four. And then I will take another break. And then we'll be back for this evening. So thank you, everybody. And I'm going to turn off the feed for a little bit. And we'll be back at one o'clock. Okay. By the way, by the way, thank you. Good job, and we'll see you soon. All righty. Thank you, Art. And thank you, everybody else. And I'm going to go here before I go to turn that off. Okay. I'm late. How is everybody? Good. 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 Great. I was. Running around trying to find all the different things that I thought I could, we might possibly play with, um, and there's never, there's never enough time to find all the things and in the cabinet and all that good stuff. But I, hey, had a great little break there. I'm ready to roll. Life is good. Uh, coloring and colorants and, and fix uh, the camera. Fix the camera. 
You mean like that? Perfect. There you go. See, that's Perfect. why that's why I keep you around, Art. So you'll tell me which camera I'm supposed to be on. <laughs> I think I'm actually going to turn the heat off in here, as a matter of fact. Yeah, turn the heat off. It's getting warm. It must be 50 degrees. Um, so let's see what we got in here. Number of folks from this morning. Uh, da, 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 da. Do, do, do. Who here likes to play with color? Who's already messing with colors and doing some color work? Just say, hey, hello. I know. So Art, you do. Play is, a, is an odd and, uh, word there. <laughs> and Jim, I know you do some. And Lewis, Lewis, you gotten into color yet? If Lewis is here with us or not. It's it's a lot of fun. I'm not very good at it, but I fiddle with it from time to time. Well, that's all that counts, uh, is that we have a good time. How do you start at it? What's that? How do you start at coloring? How do you start at color? Very simply, very basically. Um, probably the first thing to do is just get some colors in the primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, let's say, uh, and black, maybe some white, depending on what you're working in. There's, there's so many different mediums to work with. And, and what I have out here today is the Chromacraft products. Um, and I do have all, of, all kinds of different colors. And, and really, the, the, there's a lot of different ways you could go as far as getting started. Um, the probably the most interesting um, quick reward is working with the dyes, like say the alcohol-based dyes, uh, because they're not a paint so they don't hide the wood grain. So if you're looking for that bridge in between uh, painted and just natural brown wood, the, the dyes are a great way to go because you get to still see the wood. And that's what I think the first thing we'll do um, is do some color. Now I was also, I was gonna make some resin. Uh, so I think actually the first thing I'm gonna do is mix a little bit of resin for you guys so it can be setting up. Um, and we'll throw some color at that, and then we'll come back to the resin at the end of this three hours, and we'll do our little resin pour. Um, and we can we can still cover the color in the resin as well. Um, but getting started, to your question, getting started, I think working with the alcohol dyes, they're super easy. They're super, uh, you can put them on with a brush, a sponge, an airbrush, anything, and it'll put color on wood uh, without overpowering it in, in the colors. So a lot of, lot of things you can do there. Um, but for the folks in the resin world, let me, let me jump into resin first. I want to mix up some resin and what we work with is the Chromacraft epoxy resin. Now, if I can remember where I put it, I've got a little, a little jar here, but I had my big gallon kit floating around here and I'm not sure how much is in it. Oh, I think that's enough. I was almost had everything out. Now I'm I'm a big fan of, of working with, with oops sorry about the cabinet there. I'm a big fan of working with the resins. And to me, resin is a is a fun one because there's a world of things that we can do with it. Um I know that with this with the chroma key, it's gonna look kind of strange. So I'm gonna put you in the overhead, and I didn't work on that overhead camera before I got it before I got done. Um, one of the things that's really fun that I like to do is hybrid work. So part wood, part resin. This is a, a, a resin bowl with a everybody's turned a funnel, right? You can you can you don't have a to funnel. raise your hand. What's a funnel. A funnel, you know what a funnel is, Art. You, you made <laughs> I one absolutely last do. Um, everybody's turned a funnel. And this piece of wood, I'll, let me go over here to the end because the color's so much better. This little piece of maple in here was actually the funnel of a bowl that I turned and I put it in a bowl casting and talking about color. Well, we color the resin. This happens to be turquoise and there's probably some white in there. And then there's uh, powder pigments, uh, pearlescent powder pigments here in the bottom. That's what that copper is. And if I turn it around this way, 
You can see all the different kinds of swirls and patterns that we can get. And so resin is another great place uh, to start. If you start small, uh, it's not overly expensive and you don't need a lot of equipment uh, if you keep it small. Um, if you've heard that you need a pressure pot to do resin, there are certain things that you do uh, need it for, but there's other things that we don't need it for. And like today, uh, what I'm gonna pour, I probably will put in a pressure pot at the end of the day, although it wouldn't be 100% necessary, and, and I'll tell you why as, as I go along. Um, so that's, that's uh, hopefully that color is right, and you're not seeing the background uh, on that. So I'm gonna jump back to my key and back to the front camera. Because the reason I wanna jump in this, I need to get the resin mixed so they can be sitting here and cooking, okay? Um, so let me get out my board. So I got some boards to keep some of the resin off of <clears throat> my lathe as well. And I will go to the overhead. Now I have, I'm really simple. I like to keep things simple. I eat yogurt every morning at, at five or 6 a.m. And so these yogurt cups are the perfect measuring device for me. You can buy the fancy graduated cups and spend money, or you can use what's left over. I like to use these. The Chromacraft resin that I'm using today is an epoxy, and it is a two to one, two parts resin to a one part hardener. So what I will do is I will pour up one of these cups with hardener and then two with resin. Real simple that way. I don't have to measure these cups are free after eating. I don't have to clean them. I just throw them away. And they all have exactly the same lines in them, same uh, measurements. So I just go to a certain point right there. And this is my super easy measure. And I just, like I said, I just want to get this mixed and then we'll come back to it later. Now it's kind of cold today, as you can see. Turned and the I heat off too soon, didn't you? Yeah, and I didn't take this in the house overnight. Maybe I should have started this one while I turned this upside down while I was at lunch. So one thing about resin is it is rel relatively, uh, here we go, temperature sensitive. Temperature sensitive. And optimally, I would have carried this in the house last night, but I was in the office until after nine o'clock and I just didn't think about bringing this in the house to warm it up. Luckily, this is not a make or break project that I'm gonna make here or cast up here today. So I'm not gonna worry about that too much, but optimally you would have this at room temperature uh, for at least 48 hours to make sure that it's all uniform in its temperature. And I'll, I've got a digital thermometer and I'll pull it out here in a minute. We'll see what the temperature of this resin actually is once I get this all in here. And, Brad, yes. Is it always two to one or are there any time when you would use less than two to one? Um, this particular product is always two to one. Okay, thanks. Different products have different ratios. And that's a very good question because some are by weight and some are by volume. So this is the Chromacraft epoxy and it's by volume. If you're using alumilite urethane, which is extremely popular, it's actually by weight. And people will make the mistake of when they change between uh, mediums, if you will, from the epoxies or urethane. And if they don't read the directions carefully, I've had people do this by weight and say that it, they had trouble with it. Well, because it's not the right, right mixture. So be sure when whatever you get, whatever brand you buy, if you want to start playing with resin, um, be sure to read exactly what the manufacturer says, how to, to measure it out. Because it makes a big difference. Thank you, sir. Yep. And a personal preference, uh, if you buy, if you start with polyester, you might be inclined to start with a polyester resin because its its expense is quite low. You, you won't really like it that much. It smells horrendous and it's brittle. 
so it yes, it's it's half the cost and twice the bother to work with the uh, the polyesters. And I'm looking for another cup here to mix in. Makes a fine suit, however. It makes a fine suit. Uh, well, I, I reckon things how I don't even own a tie. I wouldn't know anything about a suit. So, Bradley, if this isn't polyester, what is it considered? This is epoxy resin. Just epoxy resin. Okay. Yep. Um, it is a casting epoxy. And there is a difference. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a million and one. I'll pop back up here for a second. There's a million and one resins out there. Um, all these different variations, be it urethane, be it polyester, be it epoxy. Um, there's a lot of variations, a lot of different formulations. And they are, if the manufacturer is honest, they are formulating for a specific cause. So, or specific use. So if you want to do casting, uh, you want to find a resin that at least they're stating it's for casting and especially turning in our case, um, because a bar top clear coat epoxy resin will not, it may get so hot when you put it in a volume, like say something this big, that it just splits and cracks and does all kinds of crazy things. So it has to be, and you'll read or hear deep pour a lot. Um, and in the resin world, what the, they often call a deep pour is only two inches, two inches thick. And there's all these factors, just kind of a, kind of a, uh, a little of a, a little bit of a black, uh, art or science, if you will, as far as how it, you know, how it really responds. Because one day you can pour, you can make a, a certain batch, the same size as you have done, been doing forever. And it doesn't do very well, and you don't know why. And that exact same batch has done great for for years for you before. And it doesn't take much in the way of temperature um, for them to do different things. A few degrees, if you have uh, a short cure resin, a fast cure resin, uh, this this resin. One of the things I like about it is it's a long open time. It's got a two hour open time at 72 degree room temperature. So that's a long time. Uh, not as long as some that are, uh, there's some some resins out there now that are coming along and they're, the slower it cures, the, the cooler and the slower the rate of the exotherm as the resin starts its chemical reaction, the slower the rate, the more you can get away with uh, thicker, deeper pores. The faster it is, the more trouble you have because it generates the heat so fast. So you have to, you kind of have to uh, play with that, and and know what's you know which one you want. Um, but a couple of degrees, if if you're using a uh, lumalite, let's say lumalite fast, which sets in seven and a half minutes from the time you mix it, it needs to be in a pressure pot. And if you're used to working at it with it at 72 degrees or 68 or whatever your shop is, and your shop is off by a few degrees, it may either, usually it sets up before you're done, before you're ready. So the timing is really critical. I love this resin because I've got two hours and I demonstrate it out on the road, you know, say at the woodworking shows or here on uh, Monday Methods in the studio, and I can mix it up and talk for hours, you know, hour and a half, and I know that it's not going to have set up, which gives me lots of latitude. Now, the flip side of that, and it comes kind of down to what I'm doing right now, is if I want to have two distinct colors, you know, we see the pretty swirls and patterns and pen blanks and whatnot. If I want to have that real clean, sharp delineation between the colors, I need to pour those two colors together when it's very close to its uh, exothermic reaction really starting, when it's going to start to gel, otherwise the colors are going to migrate together. Does that make sense? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So with this resin, because I have that long open time, that's why I wanted to mix it up first, and we'll set it off to the side and come back and do other things. Uh, if this was a, a fast setting, seven and a half minute, uh, Illumilite, well, by golly, I'd have to be getting this thing 
you have to get it mixed and into the pressure pot, which is now next door, uh, really quick. Yeah, so you can see that on the front camera. Good. Yeah, and that's seven minutes and 30 seconds, not seven minutes and 34 seconds. Right. It's, it's very critical. So we're just going to mix this up, and I'm going to set it off in the corner over here. And like I said, it's it's super cold. So I, here I have a digital thermometer. This is an Ames. Uh, it's it's the Harbor Freight version, 69, 79 bucks. I don't know, something like that. And it is great because it will tell me like this resin at the moment is way cold. It's 60, 60 degrees. 59.7. It's getting colder as, as I move it around. So it's approximately 60 degrees. Now I know from uh, experience that this gel time or gel temperature, when it gets up around 100 and, between 115 and 135, depending on the day, is where I want to pour it together. Um, so the room that I'm in here is basically probably 60 degrees, maybe, uh, kind of the ambient temperature. So it's going to go a lot slower. Now, I've worked with the resin out here before I had the air conditioner in, and it was in the upper 90s. And an hour into it, it was already had started to gel. So everything is based on, a, you know, a constant temperature, let's say, I mean, 72 degrees. And we'll mix this really well, and I'll mix it again. And we're just going to set it over here on the corner. And every once in a while, I'll reach over with the thermometer and see if it started to warm up yet. Now, one of the factors is the bigger the volume the faster it's going to start to warm up. If I pour this out thin, it will take a lot longer. The greater the mass or volume, the faster it will set up. Um, I did a piece which is not in here. It's uh, next door. That was, gosh, I don't know, it was about 18 inches in diameter probably. And it was kind of like a big platter and I poured the back in resin. And this will give you an idea of what happens. The outer edge was maybe a quarter of an inch thick. And then as you got to the middle where I had dished it out, well, it was about an inch thick. And it had all got poured at the same time and been sitting for an hour, hour and a half. And it was a hundred and let's say it was 115, 120 in the center and only about 95 out on the edges due to the difference in the thickness. So the, the volume of the resin itself has an effect on how fast it heats up. So we'll just let this sit. And now this is not a water clear. This is a, an, an amber. And we'll just sit it over here on the corner. And we'll check on it from time to time. And then we'll separate it back out and make some distinct colors. And this probably looks like the back of the room right now. So if I go overhead and I turn off that, you should see the, the green to it, especially if I go to the end camera. Uh, this is just some, some excess resin uh, that I poured into a, a mold after the fact. And it's got a little bit of wood in it, uh, which is a hybrid casting. And I think, yes, I brought one hybrid out. Let me talk about it real quick before I change gears. And then we'll go into dyes. So this is a hybrid cast in that this is a pecan limb. It was all rotten. There's the top of it. And I stabilized it in stabilizing resin. And then I dropped it into one of my, my usual molds, a cup here, and um, mixed it with resin. And so now it's completely filled. All the voids, in theory, are filled with the resin. And we may turn this today or tonight. Uh, I haven't turned into this one yet. So these are great fun because you can take a, a, a rotten piece of wood, and it gets a ton of character when we do these. Okay? All right. So... Turn that back on, turn that back on like that. And we'll set this guy off to the side. And we'll start with uh, some basic coloring, something with an alcohol-based dye. Uh, there's water-based aniline dyes. There's alcohol-based aniline dyes. Uh, the Chromacraft product that I have here is an alcohol-based dye. It has a little bit of uh, shellac in it, and it has a little bit of a uh, resin. I, they just say resin. I don't know what resin it is. Um, what that does is it adds a little bit of sealant to the wood as well. Helps seal up the wood and, and keep the layers from blending together. Um, I used to work with water-based 
die uh, predominantly. As a matter of fact, that's when Chromacraft came to see me. I, I was known for my dye work um, and the things I would do. And I was working with a water-based dye. And I was at AW in Atlanta, however many years ago. And the owner of Chromacraft came over and introduced himself and, and told me about his product and asked me if I'd be interested in, in uh, working with them or taking a look at it. And I said, well, yeah, sure. And then when I found out they're only 30 minutes away from where I live now, uh, I said, sure. And I went over to the conference room and I looked at all the products and the epoxy colors and the, the dyes. And I've been working with them ever since. Uh, so there's a difference in these water-based and alcohol-based resins or dyes, excuse me. When you take a piece of wood and let's say you sand it smooth and with working with the dyes, my opinion is you don't need to sand past about 220. OK, uh, you don't want to go 400, 600, 800, all that. You don't, you don't want to burnish it up and, and get it uh, super smooth. You want to keep those pores open. Uh, the alcohol based dye and, th and some of this goes back to historically and the the, the, uh, the chemicals have changed. They've gotten better. But historically, the alcohol based dyes, they don't raise the grain. And, and depending on what you want, that's a good thing. A lot of people don't want the grain to raise back up and get kind of fuzzy. Uh, but the alcohol dyes for a long time weren't as light fast as a water-based dye. So the water-based dyes were, were preferred uh, for a long time. Now they're about neck and neck uh, as far as light fastness. And especially if you put a good UV inhibitor finish over top, uh, you won't probably notice a difference. But you still will notice a difference in the grain being raised. So if we use an alcohol-based dye, it doesn't raise the grain per se. You won't really notice it. If you use a water-based dye, it will raise the grain. Um, it will get fuzzy, and it's noticeable. Now, I liked that. A lot of people don't. But I was looking for a lot of depth uh, in my piece, in, my, in the wood itself, in the color. And the reason I liked the grain to raise is if you think about it at uh, microscopic level almost, so it raises the grain. And you have all these little fibers and they're fuzzy and they're all colored. And my finish uh, is a lacquer, lots of it. And so I would sand it to 220. I would dye it with the water-based dye. It would raise the grain and I wouldn't sand it. I'd just leave it just like that. And I'd put on six coats of lacquer. Right, let that six coats of lacquer dry. Just lightly sand it the next day. And what we're doing is we're starting to cut the finish down. We're flattening the finish, but we're not really touching the wood fibers. And then I would put six more coats on in the course of a day. They dry really fast, put one an hour on, and I would cut that back. Now, the first day when you sanded it, you saw all these little shiny pock marks uh, in, your, in your finish. The second day when you sanded it, you shouldn't see any. You might see maybe one or two because uh, lacquer always melts the coats below. So once you've cut that finish flat, you haven't affected the wood, so that, that fuzzy profile that you got from the raised grain adds to the depth of the piece. So to me, that was a positive. Uh, to other people, they don't, they don't want that effect. Um, the alcohol base doesn't do that. Now, it's subtle, but you know, it's, it's a difference. Um, the water base will actually, you know, because it's water, it will swell the wood a little bit, but not, not noticeably. So that's the biggest difference between the two is the raising of the grain. Uh, this dye with the resin in it and a little bit of shellac, again, it seals it. The, the water base doesn't have any sealers in it, so they, they act differently there. Now, I brought out uh, a birdhouse that I was playing with a couple of weeks ago out here. And I'm going to do this just so I don't walk in front of the camera completely. Oh, and I just unplugged my controls for the switcher. There we go. So this is this piece is blue, so I'm not sure if it's showing black to you or not. But all I really want is the wood. It's showing background. It's beautiful. Yeah, I figured as much. <laughs> but we're just going to put it off to the side. We're not really interested in the piece so much right now. We want its lid and its base. So this is what we want is the... Is the uh, the top and the bottom, okay? And I just want them to be black. So this is the most simple uh, thing to do with the dye. 
we're just going to put a little bit of black dye in a little cup and take a brush and we're going to dye it black. So I will go to the overhead. This is this is the first step 101 for you. Gives you the basis of getting going. You could use the airbrush, which I'll use later, but this is simple enough. We're just going to paint this on. And so I want you to see that you don't need anything other than a cheap China bristle brush and some dye. More of my yogurt cups. You see a theme here? And a little bit of black dye. And you should wear gloves doing all of these different things. I usually don't, but today I'm going to try and be a good guy, good boy, and put on my gloves. Because you'll end up getting it all over you sooner or later. Now, the beauty of this, though it's black, you will still be able to see the grain and the pattern in the wood because it won't completely uh, occlude it. And another thing that you can do, I'm going to pop back up here for a second. Uh, another thing that you can do with your dyes, and I, and I strongly encourage you to, uh, maybe not so much as black, but with the other colors, the reds, blues, yellows, greens, oranges, magentas, so on and so forth, is the manufacturer has made it at a certain strength, which I'll call 100%. Um, you may find that it's more color than you want. Think of it as almost too much saturation, too much color. And what you'll you'll find, I found at least, uh, have found for in the past, is if I cut the manufacturers, if I took this indigo, let's say, and I cut it in half, this I'd, I would cut with uh, denatured alcohol, which I have right here, cut that in half. Now I have a 50-50 mix. And I would also take that mix and I would cut it in half, Okay. Then I, so I have 150 and 25, and I would take a test piece of wood. Let's say this is actually the same uh, piece of wood as these roofs, roof and base. Okay. Um, I would put the different ratios on there to see which one I liked the best, because the full strength might be too rich, too much, too saturated, and not bright enough or pop enough for me. And the next thing you want to do after you put your test colors on is put a coat of finish on it because the coat of finish is also going to affect how it looks. It's going to affect the color. Sometimes it affects it a lot. Sometimes it only affects it a little teeny bit. Okay. So do some test strips. If you've got the extra wood, even if it's a corner of the piece, um, do your test colors in different ratios, put your finish of choice over the top, and then you'll know as close as you can to what you're going to get. Okay. Now, I saw that somebody was trying to get in and they might not have. So let me pop you just to the overhead and walk over and make sure that there's not somebody. People have seems to have been able to get in uh, automatically. But I want to make sure that there's nobody uh, waiting that I'm aware of. Where did my mouse button go? I have to go over here in the control room. And I don't see anybody. I think we're all good. I do believe. Okay. Just double checking. Don't want to leave anybody out the door. So, real simple, straightforward. Uh, we're already in the overhead. And I, I apologize for the color. So let me go to the end camera, just because I didn't fix that color. And I should have, especially doing colors. So this is the base. And we're just going to brush this on. This is the Harbor Freight Cheap China Bristle Brush. Nothing fancy. I'm just going to brush this on. Now, one of the things that's really important about uh, putting dye on is you want to get the entire piece covered before you stop. If you stop halfway because the phone rang, you might not notice it on the black as much, but in, in other colors, you will certainly notice it. If you stop, sorry about that, uh, lifting it down. If you stop halfway and then you come back, you're going to have the equivalent of two coats in one spot and one coat in all the others. Okay? So you want to be sure you get the whole thing. Now I'm also going to turn this over and do the very bottom. The 
Now, that's all there really is to the basic die work. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind, that's a great little pattern there, too bad it's going to be on the bottom, is with dye, once you dye the wood, it's not like paint. It's not sitting on the surface and you can sand it right off. You pretty much, as I like to say, you own it, okay? It's going to stay in there. Um, you can sand it, but you'll only sand parts of it off. That's a pretty cool little pattern that how some of the flex, the flex in this uh, didn't take the die. So as you can see, you, you never know what you're going to get. All right, so that's our base, and let's do our lid, our top, our roof, and we'll do the bottom edge of it first. And just for clarification, this is 100%, correct? This is 100%. This is straight, straight from the bottle. I do not have any uh, mixed ratio down these days uh, around. So nothing fancy at all. This is all it takes to do the basic one color dye. No huge investment, a brush and a bottle of dye for, for just one single color. Super easy. This is going to look really cool. It's going to be a cool roof because of the way this grain is. I had quarter sawn a bunch of this um, sycamore when I cut it. And I think that's what's giving us this effect here. And if, you, if you're working in a house, you know, that's why I didn't use the airbrush on this. You know, if you've just got a spare room that's your craft room, um, you don't want to atomize things in the air, but you can brush this on. I mean, it is the smell of denatured alcohol, but that goes away pretty quick. Make sure our edges, your end grain will take up more. Now, if you have a, a, a heavy end grain issue where you're going to be looking at a lot of, or you're dying a lot of end grain, I would recommend putting a sealer on it first. Uh, Chromacraft has a clear sealer, which for all intent and purpose is the dye minus the color. Remember I said that in the, in the dye there is uh, some resin and some shellac. So the clear sealer, which I didn't bring any, pull any out. Um, if you're going to be working with end grain, if you'll put a coat of sealer on it, maybe even two, um, if it's really open grain wood, it will still die. It will still take color. But if you'll put the sealer on there, it will be much more uniform and it won't soak it up like a sponge. So your end grain won't be dramatically darker uh, than the rest of the wood, than the face grains and the other exposed wood. So depending on what you've got, um, you may want to seal it, but it's not 100% necessary. So that's that's the simple, the easiest way just to do one color. Real quick, real easy, just a brush and some dye. And set it off and let it dry. Let it dry overnight. It'll dry faster than that, but let it dry overnight. Um, and then your desired finish, uh, I like, depending on what I'm doing, either lacquer, if I want a glossy finish, or if I want satin, a uh, gloss lacquer, I can use a satin lacquer as well. Or one of my other favorites is a water-based urethane that has no sheen virtually to it. Um, it's Chromacraft WRU20 water-based urethane. Lots of UV inhibitor in it. Gives a great finish um, without looking like a finish. So it's one of my favorites. So I'm going to set these two, these two pieces just off to the side here. And I'm going to walk right in front of the camera. So I'm going to jump over here to the overhead so you I don't uh, get in the way of that and set these over here. Uh, now, the next thing, let's do, let's play with multiple colors. All right. So we'll get, the, we'll get some airbrush going here. And with an airbrush and two colors, you can do uh, a blend or a fade, a bleed, uh, a gradient, whatever you want to call it. So it, it opens up a lot more possibilities. I would recommend you don't work on your lathe, but I only have so much room in here. So I'm stuck with what I got. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I've got two airbrushes I just pulled out of the boxes. And 
let's work with oh let's say i've got all these different colors here red and yellow i'm thinking maybe i might just do some craziness just for fun i might do it uh, a blue on the bottom of this piece so this is that piece we turned i was turned in earlier today haven't sanded it, haven't done anything to it, just going to put some color on it uh, to have fun with it, okay? Now, the beauty of this piece is the way that shape is, I can spray this bottom with an airbrush and not get that color, per se, on the top edge. And the same thing, when I spray the top, I can spray this top edge, and that color wouldn't get on the bottom, just by the nature of the design. Is it the same type of dye in the airbrush? It's exactly the same dye. I'm going to take... Right from just instead of using black, I'm going to take one of the other dyes, one of the other colors, or two of them actually. And that's what I'm trying to decide what colors I want to use. And because I've only got two brushes uh, clean right now, uh, if I go to a third color, I'll have to run a little alcohol through one. So I'll make sure I've got that open ahead of time. Now, like if, if you're familiar with Nick Agar's uh, Sunset Bowl, his Viking Sunset Bowls, this is the same dye, when, and actually we have the Nick Agar uh, Viking Sunset Bowl kit. And the kit, it doesn't provide the wood or the tooling uh, to make the bowl itself, but it comes with the dyes and the finish, um, everything you need to make to replicate that bowl, the dye, the finish, the chroma gilt, uh, the silver gilt. So everything is there from a color standpoint to do a, a sunset bowl. And it's all in one package which uh, is on, it's part of the colorant sale today. Whatever the discounts on colorants, since I'm talking about colorants, uh, colorants are all 20% off today with, with the showcase. So if you're interested in playing with some colors, it's a great day to uh, save some money on the Chroma Craft products from us. So let me see, I was, I was thinking, like a little, uh, thick and red and orange on the top. And these are uh, Grex airbrushes, and we carry the Grex airbrushes. It's got the compressor up here. You can't quite see it. And if I pick it up, it's a little teeny guy, super quiet. Uh, there's a whole kit that, that uh, is the compressor, the hose, um, and an airbrush. Sets you right up with the whole, whole, whole battle uh, or kit. Quick release on the hose so we can pop them right off. So I'll make one of these red. I'm sure that's under. These just came out of the box, so I haven't even tested the settings. And this is the most basic airbrush. Uh, the internal workings with the Grex airbrushes are all identical. Uh, it's a matter of um, the features on the outside uh, how the triggers work. Everything that we carry is a is a uh, two stage airbrush. One is air, and then the second stage is fluid for the for the color. So this is a, this is the essential. It's a super basic brush. This one is the next step up that has an ergonomic grip. And then over here, I have some that I have been using for a while. These have a pistol grip to them. I like these because my hand, my right hand is all messed up and it's hard to squeeze very long. So these are real comfortable for me to use with a pistol grip and they have a side feed. So we have red in one. We're going to put yellow in the other. And we should get an orange where we cross over. without having to spray an actual orange. Though you could if you wanted to. So a little holder holds those guys. If you end up uh, doing a lot of airbrush coloring, you'll probably end up with half a dozen airbrushes, one for each color uh, over time. It's just handier than changing them out and changing the colors all the time. 
Okay, so that's the red. And I'm going to put the red. Put the red first. And I'll test, find something to test it on here. Like I said, I haven't t tested this on anything. This one I just pulled out of the box. I had wanted some more. And now I have uh, five guns. So I think I have all the colors that I really need to, to uh, work with. I'm just doing a little adjusting over here. There we go. Adjusting the fluid and the air. So that is the yellow. And in the yellow, I'm going to do best way to show you this. Hey, the, the light got a little bit better on that camera, maybe because the light in the room is changing. So I'm going to leave this. I want to try to find the best way for you to see this. What could I set it up on that it wouldn't matter and I could shoot it from the end? Hang on just a second. I want you to be able to, I want you to see the best you can. Stay. Don't fall. <laughs> if you don't give me a hard time about what I use for props, then we, we'll be okay. What a silly prop. Hey, now. Hey. There we go. Perfect. So this way you Perfect. can see, I'll spray from the, on the end camera here, and you'll be able to see how, how that's going on. I just spray all that out already. Eh, I did. That's a little teeny teeny cup. And I'm getting the, the, the rim as well in the yellow. And I'm going to go around a couple times. And the beauty of it is you, you never lose the wood grain. You can still see all the wood uh, down through it. And again, this dries really quick. Yeah, so you're starting to see, you see that color really nice. Now, I love uh, the spalted wood. See the black lines and our spalt lines? That's one of the things I love about uh, dyeing wood is that we get our own free black squiggly lines instead of having to make them ourselves, which I really like. Okay, so I'm going to leave that for now with the yellow. And if you'll notice, I was spraying towards the center. I was spraying up into the center of the piece with the yellow. So when I change over to the red now, I will spray the opposite direction. And let me check, get this on here, and let me check it over on my little test tube before. I want a nice light uh, coat coming out of there. I don't want to, I want to be able to blend this and, and have a gradient. So I've cut the flow, the, the fluid flow way down. Uh, so I think I can do it where you can see this. I'll be shooting straight forward. All right. Towards this outer edge. So I'm not, I'm not painting up onto the yellow so much. At least not initially. 
So I go all the way around. And again, this is a two stage. First stage is just the air, and then the second stage, and I pull further back. First stage is air, second stage is color or fluid. Okay, so that was the first round of color. We need to fill her back up. You see how we don't have a distinct line? There's no hard hard line in the coloration. And the, the, the lighter we have the flow control, the more we can control that uh, graduation of color. If we have a lot of color coming out, it's harder to control uh, the gradient. So I want to make sure that I have my edge, the color, the, the, the intensity that I want all the way around. Yeah, there we go. That's looking good for you. Now, the one thing you can see, if you look back over here, I have to go backwards. Um, I have a little bit of yellow in this, down in this little crease, if you will. So I'm going to change my angle even more, and I'm going to shoot back into that corner. And I'll, that will, by default, put a little bit more up on the body. But I want to have that be colored in. Now, if you were an airbrush artist, which I do not claim to be, you could probably come in there and with a real, real fine uh, tip in your gun, and you could spray that, and, and you were steady enough, you could spray that little groove a different color, just like the guy at the State Fair does. Okay. So I've got pretty well done in, in my little groove there as well. So I have my, my basic, uh, my yellow up here, my red, uh, solid red on the outside. Now I'm going to dial down my color even more. The amount of uh, air, amount of material I'm flowing. And I'll come in along here, and I'll just start to kind of blend this up in here. How are you dialing it down? Uh, the on the back of the gun. Oh, let me put it here. Back of the gun is the fluid control. So I, I turn and, and reduce the fluid control. Okay. I can also turn down the air control uh, right here uh, below the gun. So now I'm getting a very, very light amount of colorant coming out. And that's how you start to build that gradient. And you get a nice transition. And depending on just how much you want it to uh, transition, if I can turn that down a little bit more. So this is virtually drying as it's going on. Okay. So we, we go from, from red out here now up to our yellow on the top with a reasonable transition right in through here. Um, the inside color, you might want to spray it black or, or a dark color. You could use one of your, your regular colors, um, whichever you might choose. So if I, I'll hold this up now like this and the front camera, and of course I'm standing in, in wearing red, but you can see how you start to get that nice gradient. Um, the overhead camera, the colors are a little wonky still. But you can see the difference between this rim and this rim and the transition that goes through. 
And that uh, airbrush is what allows you to do that. You can't do that. You can't get that kind of a transition uh, with a with a paintbrush. Um, they we have it in an aerosol can, okay, uh, for convenience. But you don't have the kind of control that you do with an airbrush. So if you really want to make nice, smooth uh, transitions from one color to another, uh, the airbrush is really the way to go. I mean, they're super controllable, uh, very flexible, gives you lots of different things that you can do with this. Um, and remember, I was talking about doing another color. So let me see which one of these is, is almost out of paint or dye. The yellow is pretty much out. So we're going to change the yellow over uh, to a blue. So we'll clean it out. We'll just flush a little denatured alcohol through here. And we'll let that sit for a second while I... I want to put the caps on these other bottles before I knock them over. I've learned the hard way about leaving the caps off of something when I'm doing this. And I get to talking and waving my hands. And next thing I know, I've just spilled. And I just dumped that whole one out like that. So we'll put more alcohol in there. And since we're going to a blue, you know, if I have a little bit of residual yellow after the fact, it won't hurt. It won't hurt my world. Denatured alcohol is the base. Are you just spraying it out right now? Yeah, I'm just spraying it out into the air. I like the smell. Just letting it spray through the gun. It hasn't had smells like set up or anything like that. Smells like ditto fluid, huh? Smells like what? Ditto fluid. Uh, From grade school. <laughs> Let me graph paper. Uh, yeah, okay. You mean my math teacher. So let's go. This is a really dark blue. This is an indigo. It's almost purple. I had a math teacher um, in high school. I, I went to I grew up in Florida and we had really poor education, I'm sad to admit. And every six weeks when the semester started, he handed you a stack of mimeographs. And that was your coursework for six weeks. And you could turn it all in tomorrow, once a week, or on the last of the semester. It wasn't much of a teacher. Okay. So now I'm going to... Change cameras. I'm going to go inside first, and I'm going to hold the gun pretty close inside the piece. So there, there's my dark inside now, or my blue inside. And because the base falls away, we shouldn't get any blue on our other colors on the top. So we, the blue doesn't come around the edge at all. Again, you can't, you can't pull that off with a brush. It's going to it's going to slop over, you know, with a bristle brush. So if you're, when you're working on a design to work with colors, these are some of the things to keep in mind. If you've got this idea that you want to do different distinct colors, Work out a way that you have some, some natural breaks in the actual profile of the piece. This piece is, is looks cool. And even with the violet here on the bottom, well, it's indigo, excuse me. I, the violet and the indigo are very similar. Um, you still see the grain through it.
and that's good. We're out of we're out of color. So there is there's our base. There's our as we come around. Super simple, super easy. Uh, be careful with what's on your gloves. That's why you want to change. If you change colors, you change gloves, and uh, to make sure you don't get. Because I've got a little bit of blue up here on the top. Um, not the end of my world, but that's how easy it is to do multiple colors. And with the airbrush, we have a sharp, crisp line right there for the colors change. And if I turn it on overhead, even though the color's weird, you can see it's a very crisp line of color. It doesn't come around that corner. See how we, and we can still see the grain down in here. We see the ambrosia. We see the spalt pattern. And as this dries, uh, it will get even better. And spalt pattern on the top. And what I'll do is I'll let that sit for just a minute. I'm going to run a little bit of alcohol through these brushes just real quick, just so they don't set up. And then um, I'll spray a little bit of uh, finish on there. So let me pop back up here. Just so you know. I like, I'll let you look at that. I don't know. What do you want to see? I'll let you look at it from here. Uh, let's, do let's do the other one. Overhead? Front camera. Front camera. Front camera the man wants. You want to see the cloud that I'm breathing? Is that what it is? That's it. Now, the next thing I think that we'll cover, um, and again, I'm just, because I'm going to be uh, sitting for a little bit, these guns, I just want to clean them out. Uh, we're going to work with the stencil a little bit. Same thing, the airbrush, and we're going to stencil up a piece of wood here. We'll cut something up smooth, and we'll do a little uh, stencil work, which is really fun. You don't have to clean them just quick, but since I don't know how long it'll be before I get back around to it, uh, I want to keep them nice and clean. And again, it's, it's not much uh, solvent just going through there, just enough to flush it out. There we go. And we'll just leave it sit like that. Little airbrush holder is great. Put that there for the moment. Leave that over here. Okay, so we'll set this guy off. Um, I was going to spray it, wasn't I? Let's give it a little shot of lacquer. I don't have enough fumes in here yet. So let me grab some lacquer, which means I have to walk around in front of the camera. So I'll go back over to the overhead for you. I almost got the lacquer out when I was getting everything else out. You forgot to put a little dye on your chuck. A dot on my cup? No, dye on your chuck. Oh, hey, I just got rid of it. I just got it clean recently. You got to put some dye on the chuck. Easy Wood gets mad at me when I do that. So I have a little bit of gloss lacquer here and I'll just give it a, a quick spray so you can kind of see this hasn't been not, it's not really sealed much. There's a little bit of sealant in the, in the dye, but it will absorb the first coat of this a lot. So it won't stay long before it, uh, but it's trying to give you an idea of what happens when you put the finish on. My gloves are bleeding all over the place here, so I'm going to take that one off. And the same thing with the bottom here. And after a number of coats, that'll start to be sealed up. And it'll be a really neat piece. And of course, if you don't want the shiny, go with satin. 
All right, so let's set this off in another safe little corner someplace for now. I guess you could put a rusty ring on the very top if you wanted to, couldn't you? You could. We could take some chroma gilt here after a bit and and put on there. Do you have to do anything between the lacquer coats? Nope. Uh, the beauty of lacquer is you just keep right on shooting. Uh, if you if you want to have the the uh, I'm going to throw that whole glove away too. After a number of coats, you don't need to uh, physically, you don't need to, to sand it to make it bond because the lacquer, the solvents in lacquer melt the coat before. So it bonds in. You don't, uh, unlike polyurethanes where you have to sand it eat between each coat, um, you just have to, you can just spray it. But if you have a little bit of fuzziness to it, um, at some point you want to cut that down because you're just going to keep re replicating that profile. So you want to go ahead and, and lightly sand it just enough to flatten down the finish, um, and then it will stay smooth. That's the only reason you would sand in between. And you'd use 400 sandpaper or something? Yeah, yeah, or 220, 320, well, whatever whatever suits your fancy. Okay. Hey, Bradley, just to let yes. you know your front view, it's got, a lot of it's got a lot of green in it than you had this morning. It's got a lot of green in it. Yeah, your green screen or whatever. It's uh, a lot of green flashes it's through that. A bunch of fuzziness going on? Yep. Okay, let me, uh, you tell me if it gets better or worse. Let me go into producer mode over here in the control room, and it will get worse and better. That's good. Is that better right there? Yep. As, as the light changes on the outside, because I don't have the windows all closed here, um, and I don't, I don't get to see the output right now. Yep, it looks good now. Because all I see is my green screen. Thank you for that. This, this new uh, dark color, and I just put it up last night. I put it in the system last night, and I went, oh, there's a little bit of challenge here. And I'll just have to to uh to deal. So, um, I appreciate that. Let's clean up this little piece of wood right here. Let's see if I can't get uh, a nice face finish on here real quick with the tools, and uh, and then we'll put a little uh, pencil on there. Something nice and quick and easy. So if I start to, to uh, babble and ramble incoherently, that's just because of all the nice lacquer and, and alcohol floating around in the air. And you thought we were done turning, right? So did I. Let's change this real quick, get these guys out of the way. Now you know why I decided to go ahead and clean the guns real quick, because you never know how long it's going to be before I get back to it. Got my little hanger holder here. Hey, hey Jim, we're listening to your TV, man. Was it Dragnet? I don't know. It sounds like a love story. <laughs> Set them there for a second. And I need a tool rest. This is the handiest thing I've got to. It's got a nice little surface for a stencil. It's not a big piece. It takes a whole lot of commitment. Yes. Yeah. Whoever, whoever's TV's going. Uh, if you want, you can hit. If you want to hit your mute, then we. There you go. We. Uh, that way we don't hear the love story. I fixed it. Oh, uh, was that you? I did it. It was art. It was yourself. Me, myself, and I. I figured out how to do it. <laughs> also, let's check the temperature on our resin while we're in between here. So it's up to 70 degrees. It's come up 10 degrees. So we'll keep an eye on that. All righty. We just clean up this face here real quick, see if we can't get a nice 
cut across the front. Bradley, one next, one quick question. Sure, the, absolutely. That's why I'm here. Your airbrush combo kit would uh -huh. that give you? Would that give you everything from the compressor, hose, and gun? Yep. So it, that would it, be a good way to start. It's a great way to start. It's the complete kit. It's the compressor, the hose, the gun. Um, I think it's got the quick change coupler in it as well. If not, we have those. Yeah, it's everything you need to get started. Okay, thank you. And and the comp those kits typically come with uh, the tritium guns, which the workings inner workings are the same, but they have the the pistol grips if that's what you want. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I have listed uh, on there. It's either the TS or the TG, which is TG is top feed gravity and TS is uh, side feed. It says TG three. Okay, so TG that would be this style. Um, and it's got a number three uh, tip in it. Okay, and that's good? Yes, now that's right in the middle. So okay. two is the smallest, three, and that would actually probably be, probably be like, that's another TG3 right there. Okay. And then there's, uh, there's, there's two, three, five, and seven. And, and typically uh, twos and threes, maybe five if you're spraying some heavy bodied stuff, but three is right in the middle. Thank you. You bet. Let's see if we can't clean this guy up a little bit. There's not much wood here. It's things like uh, paper thin. Scraper actually makes it worse, as they usually do. Well, I'm just about out of wood because it's a piece of scrap anyhow. But that'll do the trick. We'll, we'll hit it with a little sandpaper, assuming that I wasn't planning to sand anything, so I have to remember where I've hidden it. I know where some is over here. I'm not going to get carried away. Just a quick little... Generally speaking, I, I don't like to sand in the studio because of all the cameras and the electronics. I'll sand next door in the shop over there. I guess 220 is as fine as we go. That'll have to do. <laughs> Just a little something to work with. Okay, perfect. All right. Has anybody worked with stencils much before? They're pretty fun. 
interesting, intriguing, and all that. Just when I was in the Coast Guard, we had to number everything, you know. A uh, little bit different, but the same concept. Okay, so there's our piece. There we are. Uh, let's go overhead. So oh, in the, this was on this once before. What's that? This piece? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Nice. That's cool. I don't it know if fun. I have the maple leaves in here or not. Did you use? Is that the? Did you use the Chromacraft stencils? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I forgot what his name was now from uh, up in Utah. He came to our group and did sure. a week long class. And so not only did I learn how to turn this, <laughs> but he also showed how to use the stencils. Right. Now, uh, Kirk D here. Yes, 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 Kirk. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he was fun. My wife wanted something out of me, and that's what I did for it. Yeah, it was fun. So I'm looking through here in the. In the stencils, um, and Nick Agar is responsible for all the stencil work, they have two styles of stencils. And this my in my hand is called the infill stencils. These are the laser cut um, reusable plastic stencils. And then we have the peel and stick part that is the, is the basis of what you work with, depending on what you're doing. And like I say, I have no idea what's in here. I just grab these and... Let's see here. Let's play with the butterfly. They also, I've, this stencil material, when you get a pack of stencils, uh, one of the packs has just a plain empty sheet in it, and you can cut up, cut it out any way you want to. So the... Uh, the peel and stick has the, the positive and the negative. And then if you want, you find the matching infill stencil uh, butterfly patterns, if you will. Let me show you in the overhead here. So you find the matching patterns, and that's how you work on uh, getting some of your different characteristics. So they, it works as a system between the peel and stick and the plastics. And then, of course, there's little, there's little bugs. These little guys here are bugs, and there's all the different oak leaves. Um, they, the Don Rollins, the owner of Chromacraft, told me how Nick spent weeks and weeks uh, carving and cutting and designing and drawing and going over and over on these fill patterns. This is what they call the forest mesh pattern. And there's all these different densities of this random uh, mesh. I can't imagine sitting there doing that for a long period of time. But so let's uh, start with, and this is pretty big. So we'll just use the stencil sheet to our advantage. We'll call that roughly centered. Now, I quickly learned when I first started playing with these, um, I quickly discovered I always do things the hard way the first time. And I tried to put these down into the bottom of a, a, a small bowl, very concave, and discovered that the stencils don't like to, to bend that way. Convex is okay. Concave, not so good. A little bit of painter's tape to seal the whole thing off. Uh, again, if time was not an issue, um, I would I would spray this piece, would have sprayed this piece with one coat of clear sealant to start with, just to have things be a little bit more uniform and not soak up quite as much, especially when you go to put the clear on. 
but there's only so many hours in the day. The stencil you're using, that's a one-time stencil, correct? No, you can reuse this uh, over and over to a point. Um, I probably used the peel and sticks for all the shows, all the woodworkers. I used the same stencil probably for 10 shows. It was getting pretty rough. I wanted to see how long I could get it to last. So, no, you can reuse them. It's not a one-time deal. They don't, but they don't last forever. The plastic, the infill stencil, these guys, these literally will last essentially forever. Maybe not truly forever, but they'll last a long, long time. So, let's give our butterfly um, a base coat of yellow. Get my airbrushes back. This is really, I don't know, this is really fun stuff. I don't get enough time to play with it as much as I would like to. But I always have a ball when I do. Uh, when I was a kid, I painted, you know, I did model cars, little plastic models, like, like many kids I like to think do or did. I don't know if they do anymore. Um, and I had airbrush back then. And would paint my models with airbrushes. Model cars were a fun thing. Oh, I, I loved it. Matter of fact, it wasn't that long ago. One day I just had a curiosity. I went to, I think I was in Hobby Lobby. Um, I think I was in a Hobby Lobby. And was surprised at how many models they did have. Um, other stores I've gone to, you know, there's, there's like nothing anymore. I haven't seen the hobby shops. I don't know if they do they even exist anymore. Hobby shops, you I know, haven't the, seen one for a long time, like you're talking about. You, you know, the ones where you could, go, cars. you could go buy any model and and all the balsa wood kits and all the stuff. I guess that's what happens when, when they invented cell phones. I don't know. Yeah, and a, an expensive kit would be 250. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first color I'm going to put on my butterfly again is yellow. So we'll load up a little bit of yellow here. Oh, don't drop that. Put that back over. I got to keep. I'm out of space. I'm out of space. What did I do with my yellow? It can't be far. No, dummy. It's right there in front of you. See what happens when you breathe enough uh, lacquer? And to the overhead. Right in the middle for you. We'll give them a nice yellow color. We'll let it soak and dry for just a moment or two and put another coat in there. Okay, I think we'll call that good for now on that. I may, hang on just a minute, this way I don't kill myself. Let a little fresh air into the studio. Getting a little stiff in here.
Going to go with a little bit of red once again. Giving that first cut a little bit of time to dry down. I just want to put a fine, and th this is the part I'm, I'm not super adept at yet, but I just want to put a little fine red perimeter around the edges of the butterfly. Okay, and now I'm going to look for one of the butterfly patterns. Let's see here. I'm digging through the infill stencils. Probably be I'm missing the one that I'm looking for in the right size. Be my luck today. Wouldn't you know? That is the monarch. Nope. Don't have the exact match that I want. Dog on it. Probably have lost that sheet. I apologize for that. So we'll just do something a little bit creative. It's probably over there with the big easy jaw. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly where it is. Just give him a little light pattern. And then, and then, Let's get a let's have some real fun. And we're going to make that must be the red. We're gonna make our own little color here. So 
I mixed a little bit of the indigo in with the yellow. And then we'll take a different forest pattern. If I can get it to let go of the other stencil there. It may be the ugliest butterfly I've ever made. Because I'm making it more like a leaf. <laughs> Got more of a leaf patterns. I don't have the body for this guy today. So it's it's a it's a it's, he's molting. Is what he's doing. <laughs> and we're gonna let that dry, even though it's just a speckled butterfly. We're gonna pull all this off. And set it off to the side. And what I'll do is I'll bring out the positive and it will cover over this butterfly with the other part of the stencil uh, just as soon as this is dry enough. And then we'll dye the rest of the piece. You're so clever. Well, I make it up as I go. So I'm going to take these gloves off for this. We'll give that the quick dry. And that stencil I just peeled off, I put it over on a, on the colorant cabinet. And when it's dry later on, I'll just put it back on this, this, this sheet here and we'll just use it again. Now, also, um, if you look, where's my ice pick go? This is why you want to uh, preferably seal it, but since we didn't really have that much time, see how I'm getting a little bit of bleed out up in here? I don't know if you can quite see it or not. If the wood had been sealed, I would get a, a crisper line. Uh, it's running in that in the grain of the wood. Had I put a coat of sealer on there, we would get a much crisper, sharper line. So I would recommend putting... Uh, the, that's why I talk about putting the one coat of sealant on it at least, and you'll get. What's, what sealant would you use? Um, I didn't see the, anything in your store? Uh, it's the clear. It's in the in the alcohol in the dye, and there's a clear sealant. It should be right in the in the dye section. Okay. Along with the colored dyes, and it'll just say uh, clear sealant. It it's there somewhere, or at least it's supposed to be. So this is the tricky part a little bit. You get him lined up. Drop him into place. Again, you know, I might be rushing it just a little bit, but this dye dries pretty quick. Um, and now let's find uh, a, a really nice color that we haven't worked used at all here today. Like, say, the magenta is kind of interesting. Fresh pair of gloves. If you buy your gloves at Harbor Freight, it doesn't cost you a fortune. You can go through them quickly. Just don't keep, don't let them stay around for a long time because they might start to rip after a while. Once that china smell wears out, they might start to fall apart.
Art, when you were driving down I-95, did you see uh, the Harbor Freight Warehouse? Nope, we missed that. Oh, it's right there by south of the border. Oh, well, we saw south of the border, but we weren't looking for Harbor Freight, I guess. Why not? <laughs> Actually, I was trying to keep the car between the yellow and the white stripe. Yeah. So, folks, uh, Art... Art's on vacation, and he left out of New Jersey a couple days ago, and, and they made it across the bay, I guess it was, before the something went wrong in his car, and he was keeping me up to speed on the, the woes of his car problems. Got stuck in reverse. Thought about driving down backwards, but Mrs. Miller didn't like that. There we go. Okay. And then from this point, if you wanted to do, you know, gradients out, um, other colors, you could. Magenta on these lighter woods is one of my favorites. And we'll let that dry for just a minute. Put the cat back on the magenta. And if you got it right, it works out pretty well. I got a little bit of, I was overlapped just a touch right there. But that's the basic premise on working with the stencils. Although that's the craziest looking butterfly I've ever done. From a color standpoint. It came out pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not going to apologize for it. Um for yuck since we're here as I have the door open we'll flood it with some lacquer I just like the way uh, the dyes you know like I say let the, the wood all the spalting and everything still show through and I was missing the one stencil to actually give the butterfly its, its wing pattern inside. But you get that sometimes, as they say. So that is uh, a quick run on playing with the stencils with the alcohol dyes. So we've covered just the basic uh, one coat, uh, doing uh, multiple coat blends and in different colors with the dyes. Uh, a little stencil work for what it is. Whether it's the best thing I've ever done or not is irrelevant. Um, the next thing I want to do is, I'm sure my resin is not a problem yet. Let's check that resin real quick. 73. So it's starting to warm up, but it's a long way from where it needs to be. Um, another product that gives you a lot of versatility is the web effects uh, if you haven't seen that with uh with with uh chromocraft and nick egger the web effects it's a, a spray on think of it as artistic silly string is kind of the easiest way to describe it and this happens to be white so i'll spray it on something black it basically sprays out a spider web 
and I don't have one of my other pieces handy. I don't know where it is. Uh, I've got a turquoise and white one. There's a lot of things you can do with it. And so you can have the pattern itself, the natural web pattern, um, or you can use it as a base for another effect, which is what I'll show you here in a minute. But first we'll spray this on something dark so you can see how the spider webs work. Let me get it over here. I've got a whole stash of stuff right in front of the cameras here. I get I get a lot of use out of the pieces that I have around. So here's a piece that I was playing with the uh, cloud paint on. So we might do some cloud paint on the inside today, but today we're gonna we're gonna put some web effects white on the back of this guy. So how far away, how fast, all dictates the kind of pattern you get. And I'll bring this over here underneath the camera now. So I used to do this with just the dies, and then they put it in a can. Now this has more texture to it. Um, and there's about six colors, uh, black, white, uh, cobalt blue, turquoise, terracotta and so it makes an interesting pattern and it's it's a fun thing to do uh, just to pattern things up i like turquoise and black a lot uh, when i do things the one thing you do want to keep in mind you might be able to see here uh, you, you, you get some bubbles just take an ice pick or a pin and go around and pop those bubbles okay and it'll just give you that uh, a spider web effect with some texture. Okay, interesting stuff, fun to play with. You can experiment, and you can do multiple colors over top of each other. Lots of fun things. Let me go to this other camera because that color is so weird. Do you spray lacquer over that? Uh, you can. Uh, it it won't make it. It it's got so much texture you won't get a smooth finish. You would take a lot of lacquer to get it flat. Uh, we tried out on the road last, not this year, but the year before at the woodworking shows, uh, the fellow that worked with me. Uh, we Every show we would spray it more. Uh, I had a piece out there, we'd spray it again with lacquer every single week. And in 10 weeks, we never quite got it built up to where it was smooth. So it takes a lot. So that's that's the basic effect. Now, what I want to show you is here in my stack of goodies. And I need uh, another product here. Okay. So this is a piece that has the web effects on it. And then I painted it black, just to paint it black. So it's got a lot of texture to it, and the texture came from the web effects, okay? And it looks kind of goofy, and I did this once before in a Monday Methods, and what I also have here is the chroma gilt accent paste, the gilting paste, and what you can do is you can take chroma gilt, and you load it up on your finger of your glove, Rub it together. I need my can back up here, I think. I need my prop. There we go. The light's not too harsh. And then you just lightly go over the surface and it just hits all the high spots. and you get a pretty interesting effect. And with the chroma gilt, you can use multiple colors to do this. And it's just one of those play with it as you go. 
I'm looking at the slides. I'm not sure how you're seeing that showing up in the light there. And if you don't like it, if, it, if you don't like the first round that you did, let the chroma gilt dry. Spray it black again with, a, with your black spray paint. And, or if you wanted more texture, another round of um, the web effects. This is kind of a, an, an unorthodox method, although I got it from the owner of Chromacraft. He said, hey, Brad, I was in his office when they said, look at that piece, sir. What are you thinking? I'm like, that's cool. How'd you do it? And so I had to come home and try it. And that's the effect. I'm going to bring it up to the front camera uh, so you might be able to see it better. If I can get it up close. Try to keep things straight up and down. There you go. So the, the piece, the shape of the piece is, is nothing to get excited about. That's why it's just a, a little sample piece, test piece. But you kind of get the idea. Just one of the things you can do with combining two different things. Um, let me show you something else that I brought in. Pardon my head. So this is a piece, and I'm going to put it in the overhead. This is a piece that I initially used the accent paste on, not the chroma gilt, but the actual accent paste. And I, I covered the whole thing in, in various colors of accent paste. And then I took the pearlescent powders that we typically put in the resin. And I dry brushed the pearlescent powders on top of the accent paste to get a, a quite interesting uh, effect. And it doesn't have any finish on it yet. So it's got all these different uh, shades and hues down in it. And the, the pearl, the pearlescent powder really is what gives it the, the, sh the sheen and the glimmer and the different colored accent paste underneath are what it give it its colors. So a lot of different things that you can do uh, with these different uh, mediums uh, to experiment. And if you've got a piece of wood that it just didn't turn very well and it's got some torn grain and whatnot, and it, it's just screaming to be something with texture, play with these uh, creams and pastes and whatnot because you can get some interesting, interesting things out of something that, you know, otherwise might not have been uh, much to get excited about or look at. And I'll set this one off now that I got it all over my hands. Set this one over here. We've got stuff all over the place today. And the other thing I did, and I didn't buy this earlier, but I'm going to do it right now. Uh, if you ever want to test, uh, if you get some of the creams or the accent paste, get these little wood medallions. You, know, you can get them at... at uh, Hobby Lobby, or you can buy them online. And if you just want to test things out, if I have enough black in here, dye it black, and this will dry real quick. Notice the uh, prudent use of gloves. We'll just set that down let it dry for a second. It won't take but a couple minutes. Uh, and then we'll come in there with, uh, with the chroma gilt. And we can uh, play with the colors on that with the chroma gilt to show you how that works. So we'll set that guy off. Uh, other colors. What else did I have? In co oh, Rustina. I wanted to show you the Rustina product. Now, this is the one where it's going to turn into the background, and I'm going to have to turn the keys on and off, the, the, the chroma key. We were doing this last week. 
out here on Monday Methods. I'm going to set this little guy over there and just have all these guys piled up here. All right, so let me go overhead and turn off the key. So you should be seeing the true colors now. This is the, the Rustina uh, metallic paint system. And what you have here is uh, iron, is this one. And then this is uh, copper. This one is brass. And what we do is we first prime it. And here's one that's a, a mixture I've had around for a long time. And the colors are doing correctly, right? They're not, you're not seeing like the background. Good. Okay. Very good. Set that down for a second. So take a bare piece of wood. And there are two, there's two types of primers. There's a smooth primer uh, in gray or black. And then there's one they call road rash, which has texture built into it. See all the little bumps and chunks? They're actually, that is actually in the primer so that you get a more textured surface. Okay. So you can take your worst piece of wood and just make it even worse to give it a texture. And this works on wood, uh, metal, concrete, glass, plastics, uh, just about anything that you want to uh, do. And you put on the paint. And I'm going to go ahead and do this up. I'm going to do some paint. And then we put an aging on it, a, a spritzing agent. We put that on, put that on. Um, so after we paint it with the different, whichever paints we choose, we then hit it with the patina spray. So we have one for the iron or for, for rust, and then one for the, the bronze and copper that's a blue-green. It gives us the blue-greens uh, effects. And here I have, so I've already primered those. I've got copper and bronze. And these others are, that's just the, the uh, and there's the iron. So there's two primers, three primers, but I don't have the black. There's the gray and, and red rash and black. And then copper, bronze, and iron in the colors. So these have already been primed. So we'll take we'll take the gray bowl here and let's make it copper. Fresh batch of gloves. Put it in the overhead. This is really fun uh, project because the more you spray it with the aging solution the more it changes color and it doesn't happen instantly and i actually as soon as i get my gloves on i'll show you another board i have here i have a, a sample chart and which is a good way to, to go we have a kit i put together a kit so you get all the components uh two primers and three and three colors and two bottles of spray spritzers the, the patina um and it which is less than buying all the individuals and a good thing you can do is make a sample board which we did last week on monday methods i think it was or a week before and let me turn off the key so uh let's see not sure which way goes which uh it goes like this so i remember uh this is straight iron the brown here on the end this is copper this is bronze this is bronze and copper uh bronze copper and iron and straight iron again and the black is just dye in between the difference between the two sheens this is satin lacquer this is the ru20 uh water-based urethane so you can see here how it affects the that's lacquer that's urethane Again, lacquer, urethane. Some of them it shows more than others. You see more sheen here. So these are the kind of patinas that you get depending on uh, which colors you choose. 
So we'll take and put, and you can you can mix them all together. So we can put we could put brass and uh, bronze on here if we want. I'm going to shake these up real good, and I'm going to get another paintbrush or two. And, and this is a fun one. I really like working with this. So the key is that you can put the primers on and you put the primer on, let the primer completely dry. And then once the primers are dry, when you put on the colors, you want to go ahead and, and, and spray the patina on the colors uh, shortly thereafter. Okay. So here's a, here's copper. And this will be another one that we'll do this and then we'll start, we'll spritz it and then we'll set it off to the side. And watch it start to change. Let's uh, see what time is it. It's three o'clock, so we've got another hour. So we should be able to see the change pretty well uh, start to happen in this. You can't almost can see the whole bowl, but you get the idea there. Again, just a cheap cheap brush. Um, you can put it on with a brush. You can put it on with a roller. You can put it on with a sponge whatever suits your fancy. And if you want to have the mixed colors of say the bronze, you know, the, the, the green of the bronze and then the green of the copper, well, you just put both of them on here, which is what we'll do. Now, if you've got uh, lines in the piece, like this one, this bowl that I never finished, you know, that those are going to show. Um, but that's just, uh, like I say, I, I keep some of these around that I never got around to finishing. For demos, demo pieces, it's perfectly fine. And the brush strokes, so if I keep the brush strokes all uniform, it will look that way. The brush strokes actually show up as part of the finish of the of the pattern. So if you keep them in circular motion, you'll get that. If you crisscross and hatch, you'll end up with that effect as, as well. Just depends on what you want. Now I've co covered it completely with the copper and I'm only gonna cover parts of it with the bronze. The bronze is much thicker We'll give it a good stir down in here. You can't quite see it off to the side. It is real metal, real metallic parts, or, or uh, you know, it's real metal flakes that actually changes color. So it's not just a not just a chemical, but the metal is actually in there. And I knocked an airbrush over here, so I had to pick that up real quick. So one thing, I don't want to go back into my bronze with the brush. So I've, I've come out of, the, out of the jar, and, and unless I wanted to use another brush, because if I come out here and put this on, and I'm, a, I'm going to pick up copper by default, I don't want to put the copper back into my bronze uh, paint. So only do what you can or use a bunch of brushes. So I'm just going to kind of splash some of this bronze around on here. And what I'll do is I'll pull a little bit off the brush like that right there. Get my money's worth out of my bronze. Again, uh, not difficult at all. It's all a matter of playing with it and just kind of what effect you get. If you get the effect you want, um, you, if you don't like what you got, you can do some do it again. 
So, but not difficult by any means. And then we take the blue green aging solution. We just spritz it just like that. So it will take oh, 15, 20 minutes for it to start making a change. Um, and then in 45 minutes to an hour, you'll see a big change. And you can just keep spritzing. And if you don't like the way things look, you can put another coat of the, the paints on or just keep on uh, spritzing away. So kind of like our resin project that I'm keeping an eye on over there, we'll set this off to the side and I'll keep an eye on it and I'll bring it back over and you'll see how it's starting to change. So get a good visual image in your mind and I'm gonna put you on the, that's the real color right now, what it looks like, okay? And if I hold it up out front, so there's, there's what it's looking like right now, okay? So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this and we'll bring it back over in a little bit. Find some place to, I got stuff scattered all over this place now. All right, we'll put that up there. Uh, let's see, so it is 302. What was I gonna do next? Anybody know? Check your temperature. Check my temperature. Uh, it's still probably about maybe 75 now. Uh, 76, 77. I was wondering if I had any. Oh, uh, I was going to show you. That's not dry yet. But that's, I was going to say I have a little chroma gilt on that medallion, um, but it's not dry yet. Let me show you another color. Uh, this is a product that is not out yet. So don't hold me to this one. Um, it's a it's a powder we use for filling uh, cracks with, and we mix it with CA glue. And let me kill the, the and again, you get these interesting patterns. So I, I took a, a product that was designed for filling cracks. This is one of the fun things about colors and, and just different mediums that you work with. This is supposed to fill cracks. And I had spray painted it black and then the turquoise, the teal in there is, uh, might be Rustina under there. I'm not sure. Or it might be the teal. No, it's the teal uh, filler. And then this, this yellow and it's a powder and I put uh, CA glue all over it. And then I spritzed or sprinkled the powders on it. And I let it dry, and then I put more CA glue on it. And it needs more It needs more finish. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of different things you can do in colors with different products and different mediums if you just step out of the box a little bit. Try something a little different. Um, can make for some fun stuff. So that was just one that I had, had drug out here that I wanted to show you. Uh, let's see here. I think being that it's three o'clock and I've been in, out here for two hours, let's take five minutes, take a five minute quick break, run to the restroom, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we come back, hopefully this will be dry. And then we'll go about working with the, uh, casting up the resin, getting the colors into that and anything else we might get to. And we'll see how the Rustina piece is doing. So, Five minutes, that was 10. Five minutes, if you say, and we'll be right back. Does that sound good, gang? And we'll go, let's go good. right there. I'll give you this fun piece if anybody's just hanging around.
Okay. All good. All good. Let's see here. <clears throat> I came up with one other thing that is going to go with the resin that I had forgot to bring out, which was the spin gem. So I'm glad I thought about it while I was uh, running to the house and back. Let me clean some of this other stuff out of my way here. I don't know who's going to clean up after me today. Then I'm glad you'll get it. Yeah. I don't have one of those. Uh, let's see. Those guys can all stay over there. Actually, we'll move them. I'll put them back up here. I didn't mess with the cloud paint. Let's do a little cloud paint. Iridescent cloud paint. Bradley? Yes. Um, if I wanted to get into the airbrushing and coloring, uh -huh. what you would recommend going with a Grex TS3 combo kit 
would also the liquid dye seven pack and the clear lacquer. I couldn't find any sealant. Uh, the sealant's not showing up. No, okay. I could not find it. Well, we'll we'll work that little bug out. That's not to worry about. Um, the dye seven pack is is a great cross section, and it's less than buying the colors individually. Okay. So I so, would say I would say yes to to that. So are your discount codes available as of just today or today and tomorrow? Uh, just today. Okay. Uh, but if we can't find the if we can't find the sealant, I'll go look on my. I'll jump on the computer here in just a second. Um, I know it's there. It might. It just might be hiding somewhere else. It might be in finishes for some crazy reason. Um, I will. I will go look here right now. And take a look. I just have to walk into the control room where the computer is. And open up another t window tab and jump on my website. And take a look. Did you, uh, well, I'll say, I'll find it. I can say, did you search for it? But I'll find it. Uh, there have been, there, unless it's one of those ghosts in the machines where, um, my, my inventory management platform has, has done a few weird things recently. And I lost a few products. There it is. Clear sealer. Type in clear liquid sealer. Um, it's under liquid, it's under colorants, liquid wood dye, clear, liquid clear sealer. It's a horrible picture because I've changed the, the size, but, um, but it's right in there with the liquid dyes. Yep, I found it. Thank you. Okay. Because the other thing I was going to do is I could just put it. If, if I had a computer out there, I could just do that as well and put it in the uh, comment column, the link. So I was going to set up another computer over there. Unfortunately, the one that I have to put over there is silver, which the chroma key does not like silver. It makes it shimmer and, and turn the background uh, into all those said things. Like you put some rust finish on it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, since we got a little bit of time here, three fifteen, real quick, I've got I, I pulled out some of the uh, acrylic cloud paints. Yeah, and I've got this black piece down here, and we'll just chase it around with the with the airbrush, the compressed air and the airbrush. So the cloud paints that go on white, and there's actually this is a white, and there's about there's seven colors, but I grabbed looks like four. That's all I saw in there. And I have white and I have red and I have violet and I have blue. And I know for a while cloud paint was the I think is it uh Sojana, Sojana, something like that. Uh cloud paints were all the rage. I don't know if they're a huge rage now, um, but again, it's going to come out um, white, and then when you spread it out or thin it out, it will get uh, the color, and it takes a black background for it to work. So we're just going to kind of put a variety of this around on here. And as it gets thinner, you can see that blue uh, coming through on the blue. And you can you can do all kinds of crazy things with it. You can also just use the you know uh, the compressor with compressed air. But I'm just going to bleed out this airbrush.
Another way you can work with this is to uh, use cellophane or plastic and wrinkle it all up. You know, put put the paint down and then just smear it around. This is white here. This, this white is actually the white. And the, some of the white is intentional. That's why they called it cloud paint. So you get the iridescence, but it's like an iridescent cloud. I think I want some more blue in it. But you do have to have a black background for it to work. The white doesn't, didn't, doesn't do anything for me personally. I'll put some red on top of that, see if I can't make that white. It may be too, th I may have gotten the white on there now and I'm stuck with it. Unless I can blast through it. There we go. This is another one of those type of mediums where the more you mess with it, the more you learn about it. So I'm going to look and see if I have any, I think I have some like saran wrap out here, something in a plastic, even a plastic bag. Oh, here's some, here's some shrink wrap that will uh, give us the same basic effect as saran wrap. I've seen people do this. I, I haven't really tried it myself. This will be the first time. This is heavy duty shrink wrap from shipping crates that you take and, and blot it down So to each his own. I the white here, I, I, the white is overpowering on that for some reason today. Um, it's kind of killing out that whole quadrant right there. Again, we have to get it thin enough where the other colors show through. So another fun one to play with with the colors. Different colored paints. Uh, again, you do want black for a background. And again, it can be a piece that's not uh, smooth because you're not going to have a smooth surface. Uh, a lot of people will do dots, real small dots, and then they chase the little dots out into starbursts and different things. So lots of lots of different things. I like the blue myself. Uh, that's my favorite color of the product, I think. And there's a gold and there's a turquoise, turquoise teal that I didn't have in there. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but so that's the cloud paints. All right, let's set that over here. Now, I think this medallion is probably dry by now. Now, I'll just put on one glove.
Did we lose your audio again? Okay. I should be back now. Yes, I hear you. That time it was batteries. I wondered how long they would last. Well, now we know. I had a choice. Change the batteries in the one I was wearing or put batteries in an, an uh, identical set of microphone transmitter receivers that didn't have any battery in it. So I just went for changing the one I was using. So what I was attempting to do <laughs> was to hold this up. Welcome back. Thank you. To where you could see the rose red uh, color on there. Because you don't get to see it underneath here quite so well. Eh, a little bit. Even with clothes on, you get dirty. Anyway, okay, so that's accent paste on one side. Probably enough crumbly gilt on this outside this jar for what I need. The crumbly gilt is creamier, smoother. And I'll change camera ends. It's tough. I have to, uh, sorry, I'll get it figured out in a second. Upside down and backwards and it's staring into a, a light. So both of those have a great effect. Um, in the end, they look very similar as far as how they, what they do. And there are more colors of the chroma gilt coming over time. But those little medallions there are a great way to, to test your colors. Um, also, another thing that you can do uh, that's even cheaper and easier, close that up, is if you go to the box store. And I put and go into the trim department and you just get these moldings and you just get an eight foot stick of it and cut it in little sections if you want to test what the the different uh gilt creams and accent paste will look like on something uh paint them black with some some flat black spray paint or whatever and then you can test them on on these it's, it's really cheap 
Yeah, a lot cheaper than the medallions, and you get an idea, and then you can put it on the back if you wanted to, and have your own test samples, so you'll know what you're going to get. Lots of ways to test out before you commit it to the piece that you've spent hours making. Uh, it always pays to test it on something else. Is there a paste that you can put into like an engraved signature so the signature comes out? Is there a paste you can put into an engraved signature so the signature comes out? Um, if the signature was embossed, which I think is standing proud if I'm not correct, if I'm incorrect, not incorrect. So if you went across the top of it, then it would highlight that. So mm -hmm. when you, uh, in the Chroma Gilt video on the Spirecraft website where Nick's demonstrating the Chroma Gilt, he's got a, a metal item that's got numbers and letters on it, uh, of, you know, like manufacturer information. And he just goes across the, the surface of them with the gilt and then it highlights those numbers and letters. Um, if it was recessed and then if you went across the surface, it would leave the recess uh, not colored. So it will work um, either way. The other thing you can do is pack it down into the recesses and then wipe it off the top. So you can go that route too. Okay. That's where uh, one of those, one of these would be a good experiment, Get something like this and see which one's going to do the best for you and what you need to do before you commit to the piece that you want to do it to. Okay. Our resin's getting, getting where I think it wants to be molded up a little bit so this is just a dunkin donuts cup courtesy of my wife she provides these to me and this is a mold release this happens to be ejected mold release i just have a couple generic ones with the epoxy pretty much anything works some of the urethanes are a little more particular uh some of the urethanes you have to be certain which type of mold release you use or it can affect um the urethane the epoxies are a little bit more impervious uh, talking to the chemist at Chromacraft, he says uh, Vaseline works great, you know. So I'm just going to spray a little mold release in here for now. And we'll let that be drying as soon as I step away from that cloud. And that's going to be our little mold. Again, I like, I'm into simple molds. Nothing crazy and messy. All right, now I need three more of my cups. And I'm going to make three colors. So let me just go overhead here for a second while I walk in the way again. Okay. We got all kinds of goodies out here today. We are having some kind of color fun. Can I ask a question about the gilding? Absolutely. What's the difference between the paste and the gilt? You know, the chroma gilt and the accent paste and stuff what, what's the difference between them they, they okay. operate the same they they function similarly um the chroma gilt is a smoother creamier paste that doesn't have any wax in it so it's it's a different base altogether uh it covers a little better and it's it's it applies uh, smoother Whereas the accent paste actually has a wax in it. It's a wax base okay. and goes on a little bit differently. And like, if you wanted to use it as a liming wax, you could, um, there is a liming white. So it, I mean, that's what these two are. They're just, they, in the end, they look the same. They, they function differently. Um, and I was talking with Nick about it one day, uh, Nick Agar, and he's, he's, very strongly in favor and he helped develop the accent or the chroma gilt and he feels it's a better product um, and more durable than the wax base and that's where that the the difference really comes in 
is they feel that the, the chroma gilt cream is more durable in the long run than the accent paste. But they do cover differently. So you kind of have to play with them. Um, and like I say, I don't know that they're going to keep the accent paste. They have it now. Uh, Liberon makes a lot of it. And they may just let it, Liberon have it and some of the other manufacturers. Um, I like it just because it's kind of fun to play with. And there's a whole range of crazy colors. It does stink real bad. The chroma gilt doesn't have bad odor. The accent paste has got toluene in it and stinks to high heaven and, and takes days, if not longer. Um, that piece I was showing earlier, wherever I put it, that I had dry brushed, it right. stunk for days. I had it outside. You know, you, it just takes forever for it to outgas. But it holds, like, so when I want to dry brush uh, pearl powder into it, like I did, it's 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 grabbier and it doesn't move around like the chroma gilt does. So they're they're just they're two different animals. They look the same once they're on there, but they act differently in how they work. Okay, thank and, you. And and the best thing I can tell you is get one of each and try, it and you'll see that they they apply markedly different, but they look the same at the end of the day. And it kind of depends on what you're trying to do, what you want to do, as to what's going to be the best choice. If that's that's I mean that's the only way I can really think to describe it. Okay. They're the same, but they're different. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm thinking you get the gist of what I was trying to explain. Yeah, I do. If you don't want to stink, don't get the get don't get the other stuff, get the guilt. That's right. Absolutely for that, that's for sure. So I'm just splitting this up into three equal amounts. And even now, it's still, because it's so cool, um, I, would, I wouldn't I would normally mix this together until it was at least 115 degrees on the thermometer. But it's not going to get to that before our time is up today. So we're just going to move along. Um, you know, it's 85, 84, 9, 88, 84. So when we we've, we just split it up, we'll add the colors to it, and then it'll go back into one container again, so it will, it will heat up again. Um, we're going to get more blending, uh, melting of the colors, which isn't always bad, but if you want real clean, distinct, you're going to want to wait till the stuff is getting ready to really uh, gel and set, pour together. Um, and you'll get the delineation that you're looking for. So let me pop you to the overhead here. Uh, what colors were that's black? I don't want to use black. Let's see what all I brought out here. I got two blacks. I don't know why. I guess black just wants to be in one of them today. I've got red and white, and I have a copper pearl powder. And it's kind of randomly grabbed and a silver holographic glitter, which is always one of my favorites. Um, white, I'm going to put white in one, white and copper pearl powder. And one thing I've learned with the white pigments is their, their specific gravity is heavier than the others. So it tends to want to sink to the bottom badly. So don't get crazy with the whites. Now, one of the things about resin is if we add, um, like I, I brought out here, these products called spin gems, and they're actually just polyester uh, faux stone, if you will. It's specific gravity is, is heavier than that of the resin. Um, and technically glitter is too. And given time, it's going to sink to the bottom. Now, the glitter takes a while. The spin gems would go right to the bottom of something. But they make for a nice faux stone that you can add to uh, a resin project or add resin to them. The, the blended spin gems, the, the granite, the green jade, um, sandstone, they all really look like stone. Uh, the others that called mixed are their singular colors, 
it's confusing. The blendeds are a blend of colors. The mixed are a mix of textures of one color. So this white now has got this, this copper hue to it, but a pearlescent effect. Kind of a terracotta color almost, but with the copper in it. Um, if I mix that with a red, going to be an interesting little guy. And these the tints are, they won't dilute the resin. If you work with uh, an alcohol tint, you have to be careful because it can dilute the resins. So the, like with Illumilite, Illumilite sells, sells its own Illumilite resin tint. And it's an alcohol base. So are the Jacquard tints. And you can only put about, uh, I think, 4% or something like that in. And it starts to affect the resin. Um, whereas these, relatively speaking, to the point of opaqueness, they won't hurt the resin. And you can put just a little teeny bit. I mean, just put some on the end of a toothpick and get a translucent color uh, if you so desire. And now I'm going to suspend the holographic glitter in the red. Now, I don't have a piece of, of wood here today to make a hybrid piece. Um, they're really fun to have the hybrids. I'm going to put a little bit more sparkle in here. Okay, so that was a lot more sparkle. Can't have enough glitter. Worst case scenario, it goes to the bottom in the tenon area and no harm, no foul. The other thing I'll do sometimes is I'll sprinkle some on the very top after I pour it into a mold. And then I leave, I like to leave for these, I'll leave the third one uh, clear. And then the best one to you, for you to see, I may get my little jar, my paint can back out here again for that end camera. Whatever kind of prop it takes, right? So a little bit of red. A little bit of clear. This one's just going to be kind of a hodgepodge of color. Be interesting. I've, I've not done this copper with white before and, and red into this combination. This is probably going to end up just giving us a solid color um, when it's all said and done, just because of the timing and the colors are so close. The other thing I might do is take another color. I might take some of the white pigment and just drop the white pigment in here on its own and give it a quick stir just for another uh, color break in this, if you will. Putting the clear in helps uh, break up the other two colors. And I'll pour this around the outside. And the pearl powder will do its own thing. It, it, it never really uh, blends. It always separates. And 
I'm not sure what it's looking like on the side. So yeah, from the side, you just see like layers of ice cream uh, in there. From the top, oh, you're looking at the top, I'm sorry. Um, from the side, you see the layers where it's layered like that. You saw what was going on in the top. So the other, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some white again. And I know the white's heavy. So I'm not going to take much. And it's actually also pretty strong. And I'll put a little bit of white. And because I have it here and it kept screaming that it wanted to be in this mix, a little bit of black. And then I will find the stick that I had earlier if I can. I'll just use... Well, I'll use whatever I can in a pinch. Pencils always work well. And I'm just going to come in and just kind of pull the colors up from the bottom. And then those other pigments go back down in there with it. And because this is um, not going to set yet, that black and white especially the white will start to sink down to the bottom because it's not mixed in uh, super well, but it will start to migrate down. And with the pearl in this, you'll be surprised. It looks, and with the pearl and the glitter on the side, you know, it, you can start to see the, the holographic. I don't know if you can see it from there or not, the shimmer in there. Um, and I see the swirls, and I know that these colors are going to to blend together, and yet we're going to have the swirls because of the pearl powder in there. Um, the other thing I could do, if I wanted to put some more pearl of a different shade in it, uh, if I have another one that I think might be complementary in there, let me look real quick. I got a bunch of them, but they're all on the top shelf here. Well, gold is always one of my favorites. So we'll go back to the overhead for you. I'm going to add some pearlescent gold. And again, I'm just going to stir this on the top to kind of get it into suspension. And then I'm going to reach down and pull the other resin up to it so that it starts to pull it down in. Make sure it's all... Uh, in suspension, even on the top here, it will start to drift its way down to the bottom. Now, these spin gems that I was talking about, these are faux stones. That's uh, fluorescent pink. Um, and if this was at a gel stage... I would drop this in, knowing that, it, and that's uh, smoke. You can see the different size granules. If, it, if this was really close to setting, I could drop these in. There's a marine blue. And they would slowly sink. And what we would hope for or try to calculate is that they would um, not make it to the bottom before it set up. This is one called gold mine, which is a combination of colors. And I'm going to go ahead and dump this gold mine in here. Because it's a real, real fine powder. This one is the kind of like the, the dregs. Doesn't have any real heavy pieces. 
no big chunks. So it may stay in suspension for me a little bit better. But I know also that it's going to sink, so I'm just going to get it off the surface tension here. And I know it looks crazy now, but when it cures and you turn this, it will be quite interesting. And if you watch the Spirocraft page in a couple of days, I'll post that up. A picture of that. It might, like I say, it might look crazy now, but it'll be pretty cool. So let's go back up here. So that's how that resin gets mixed. You know, so we mixed it a couple of uh, hours ago, and it's you know two hours. It should have been uh, already started to set, but because it's so cool out here, you know, it's still in the 80s temperature wise, um, instead of. About 135 is where it actually starts to, to set solid. This will start to heat up again. So there, it's at 88. So it probably will start to go uh, pretty quick. And when we wrap up here today, I'll go put it over in the pressure pot because we'll be wrap, we're going to take a break again here in about uh, 10 minutes, it looks like, before clock. Uh, so I'll go put this in a pressure pot. The pressure pot is going to help uh, remove any air um, with this long open resin, I could also degas it. I could put it in a vacuum chamber, the same one we use for stabilizing. I could put this in a vacuum chamber right now and pull a vacuum on it and pull the excess air out of the resin because we just put a ton of air in there. Uh, by adding those components, uh, the glitter, the pearl powder, and especially the spin gem powder, when we did that, we added air into the fluid, uh, much more so than you'd ever think. And you could put this in a vacuum chamber and while it's still fluid, pull a vacuum on it and it would pull the air out and it would bubble and you'd pull the air out of it. And then you could put it in your, in your pressure chamber and have uh, much less chance of having any bubbles. Um, since this is solid resin, actually I could probably get away with not putting it in the pressure chamber pressure pot uh, because there's no wood in it. But if this was a hybrid piece where I had introduced a piece of wood like the other one, uh, that brings a lot more air uh, bound to all the surfaces and any holes that it has. So those you definitely want to put in a pressure pot and compress the air down. That's what the pressure pot does. Usually you run them up to 70 pounds and any excess air that's in it, instead of coming up to the top, it just gets compressed uh, down to nothing and goes away. So that's what I'll do uh, at four o'clock. I'll carry this over next door where the pressure pot is. And pop it in the pressure pot. Now, let's take a look at our Brandon, bowl. Yes. If you were to put some wood in there, would you just put it in now? Uh, yes, I would have had the wood in the mold and poured the resin around it. Resin, would you put, you put it at so the wood would be at touching the bottom of the container? Sure. Okay. Um, or it could, you know, it can be suspended away from the bottom. Um, it doesn't really matter. It just depends on how it fits in your mold. Uh, sometimes the wood will want to float. And I've got a method where I take um, the cup and I'll use uh, uh, shish kebab skewers. Okay, and I'll go right through the top with two of them in an X pattern. Down, say, maybe a quarter of an inch from the top of the, of the cup. Put the wood in, put the skewers in place then pour the resin in, and the wood, if it's trying to float at all, um, it can't float any higher than that. Otherwise, it'll bob up to the top like a cork. Uh, if the wood has been stabilized, it's saturated in resin and typically isn't going to float, but doesn't mean it's not always going to float. Okay, got it. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. So if, you, if you're not sure, make yourself a fail-safe. Um, that it's going that you will hold it down. Yes, I learned that the hard way uh, early on, thinking, "Oh, this has got uh, it's been stabilized. This one won't float." And I would have one float, and I was like, it might "I had these great ideas of it floated, and it floated and turned sideways." Um, 
made an interesting piece in in the end, but it wasn't what I had what I thought would happen. Um, that's one of the fun things with the, with the resin work is as you experiment with it because it's not an exact science. There's lots of things that don't do what you thought they would. They kind of surprise you, but that's what makes it fun and interesting. Um, and as long as you can turn it, literally turn it into something, then it's all good. Um, so when you start messing with the resins, don't make big batches. Do small little projects. Go down to the Dollar Tree. Uh, you can tell I'm a big fan of, of not spending a lot on my molds. Go down to Dollar Tree where there's all these little plastic things that are, you know, six for a dollar or whatever. Uh, spray mold release on them. Make a variety of different little sizes. Start with bottle stoppers. So you're not using a lot of resin because uh, the resin, I mean, it's not outrageously expensive, but it's not cheap either. Um, so start small and work your way up as you get to understand working with the medium. Uh, and you'll be happier that you didn't just pour $56 into something that isn't what you wanted. All right. So let me change this over. Our piece here that we have put the paint on has now, you can see how the colors have changed. So the green is starting to come in. I hope it's not the color, when I turned off the chroma key, it should be the color of the back. Or not, it's not the color back. And so I'm gonna spritz this again, which will keep the process go continuing. And you just go over and over till you get it to the depth you like and the color type that you want. It's, it's quite simple and lots of fun. Like I got a little extra down in there. You may not want to let it pool at the bottom. Just run it around. You may even pour it off. And by having the copper and the bronze in there, we're going to get two different shades of green, two different uh, patinas. And again, if you if you don't like the brush marks, you know, you might come back again and just kind of smear some around. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. All depends on what you want it to look like. Okay. So that's how that's how that works. Uh, and again, you know, this will dry, and it'll be another color. So we'll put it back off to the side. Oh, speaking of uh, things that floated in resin, this is the piece I was talking about. This, the, the yellow that you see here, that's actually a little hollow form. Uh, and it's actually, it was blue. And this is what I had dropped down in there and, and filled it with resin and I poked it down and it's a piece of aspen. And it kicked over sideways. And so I said, well, you know, it, it is what, what it is. And when I turned it, I got this interesting spiral pattern. So here's the resin and here's resin and here's wood. Here's wood down here coming to one side and not on the other. Um, so sometimes you get you know, something kind of interesting out of it. And this bare wood here will, will take dye to an extent. Now, I'm going to assume that these fibers are fairly well saturated. Uh, because of the resin, but we can find out right quick. And um, if we want to, let's take a little aerosol blood red so we don't have to make a mess. That's the beauty of having you know, literally hundreds of pieces hanging around. If you spray it with a certain color and it doesn't look good, you don't really worry about it. But I'm kind of curious to see if this wood here will take take the color. I have found this dye works great. Um, did I bring another piece in? Yes, you can actually dye the resin with these alcohol-based dyes and do some pretty cool things. Um, that's one thing I forgot to show you. I have found ways to resurrect uh, an ugly cast. So this piece is just kind of two shades of green. This was a bunch of old resin. I had a, a bunch of little quartz that, you know, they all had a teaspoon in the bottom kind of thing. And I drained them all off uh, one day, just consolidated all the empties that weren't quite empty. And it wasn't the best resin anymore. And when I mixed it, it didn't really set up very well. Plus it had 
some funky colors to it. And I found that if I turn this now and then dye it with the dyes, um, it will completely color it and the dye will stay on the resins. So like I say, if I took this indigo right now and do I have another little cup handy? Mm, no one looking for something here. I can always get another one. It's it's amazing how well it works. And I've taken some that were had no no color value. They were they weren't attractive looking at all and probably weren't going to be. Watch this make a liar out of me. Um and they worked out great. So obviously this hasn't been turned, but that's that's neither here nor there. Especially if you if you spray it on with an airbrush, and I'm just kind of brushing this on now, that color will stay on that resin. So if you turn it and sand it to say 220 and then dye it, that's the color you'll get. Of course, that's not showing up super well. Um here, let me show you here. You see the difference a whole lot better there. So that will stay that color. So you can take a resin that ended up being really ugly and come back in with your dyes and make something out of it. Just like, let's try, take this red here on the bottom. Now the red may not do as much because it's going against that green. And then when I sprayed the dye on it, it uh, the aerosol made that bleed. Oh, not a bad effect though, if you want it. Looks like something out of a horror movie. Um, but I will, I still, I save this piece because I'll turn it and then color it, make some little goofy thing out of it and color it up. I don't throw away any of the resin, even if it's the ugliest thing in the world, because I've learned that I can color it, get under, um, and put color to it and make something out of it. So, you know, it's not always about, did you make a mistake? It's about how do we recover and the different colorants and whatnot can can do a lot. Um, if you turned a bowl and it turned out nasty grain or or you got to catch it the last minute, take uh, the Rustina product, put on the Road Rash primer, give it all this texture, give it some color, and by golly, you got a whole new piece. Um, so it's a great way to salvage uh, what might have been otherwise wasted time if you can't find a way to do it. Um, oh, here's here's a little sample. I didn't show you this earlier. Let's see if you can see it. Uh, you go to the end camera, turn that off. This is the spin gems in one of the. This is a little bit of green resin, and this is probably um, the granite spin gem. This is actually the little bottle stopper kits or the uh, key ring kits that, that we sell. It's got the stainless steel loops on either end and the urethane loops here. This is your hand your hand sanitizer. Um, it's got the brass insert from stainless steel bottle stoppers. It's all bottle stopper parts. Um, and this is, it makes the, and we use these and a lot of people have bought them, but I still got a whole, I mean, I bought them everything by the hundred. Um, so I still got a, a quite a few left, but they're a fun little project and it's everything you use to make bottle stoppers. The mandrels are all part of the bottle stopper process. Um, and so you can use, uh, the spin gems to make some interesting colors. Um, if you're a pen turner, uh, the granite has been a huge hit with the pen turners. And if you'll do some color in your resin, uh, you can get all kinds of uh, variations. And then if you will alter the ratio uh, of resin to spin gem, uh, it controls how much, how it looks. You can make it like concrete where there's very little resin and a lot of spin gem, or you can have a lot of resin and a little bit of the spin gem. And you get two different extremes, so it's a fun it's a fun piece of a project to, to play with, especially the blended colors. Um, they they really make the nice looking stuff. The crazy stuff I like the fluorescence just to have fun, uh, but uh, for things that look truly nice, the blended spin gems and um, in the different colors are really nice. Glad I picked that up and, and forgot hadn't didn't forget about it. Four oh three. Hey, it's break time. I got to go to UPS. <laughs> I have to ship some stuff out today. Um, 